Okay, so we're good Looks on memory good. as well? Yeah, mm-hmm. this has 11 hours. It's okay, like, yeah. and everything's I'll, recording? Everything's I'll start recording this camera. <laughs> Every time you ask a question, I like, my mind resets. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Dude, I feel that. Know how that feels. <laughs> <laughs> Someone, I saw a TikTok that was like, Oh, if, if you had to name five songs by this person, you die. And then I was like, what if I couldn't name five of Yeet's songs? And then right then and there, I tried doing it. And I was like, Duh! <laughs> put my own self on the spot. Pressure. I don't know Pressure if I've ever heard crazy. five songs. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Naming five songs quickly. It's like, is there a time limit? Is it like a quick time event? You know? I don't remember your names right now. Yeah. <laughs> you, Doye, that's your name? <laughs> You gotta check the birth certificate, man. <laughs> you gotta check the files. I don't know. I do not know. Yeah. Do not know. How's How it going? I'm good. You're good. <laughs> You're good. Am I moving closer well, to the mic? Where are we? You can adjust the mic too yeah. if you want to. I think it it's it's bit. like it's better. We uh, it's down a bit. we yeah. black bagged you in Chelsea and drove you here. You don't know where you are. Uh huh. Um, no, there's some green stuff on the yeah. table. Yeah. Yeah. Undisclosed yeah. remote location. Yeah, we're just <laughs> just trying to simulate your uh, your natural habitat. You know? I'm I'm yeah. an archaeologist. I've been in worse situations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah This yeah. kind of looks like where an archaeologist would train, like when they train the police. Mm-hmm. Like th- like this is what <laughs> this is like. This is like Indiana Jones background. It's like this is you might come across this type of right. topography. So right. Really, you know, yeah, right. So orientation. You have to practice the yeah. ball, like running. Away from the ball, like, <laughs> I feel like if we were training, if we were training police, we would clear all this out. I think. <laughs> no, but that's yeah, what this. I get, yeah, I no, I appreciate. It. The I feel at home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's homey. It's. I mean, it, it's kind of um, covert. Like, kind of have to be homey. We're kind yeah. Of, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like involuntary Yeah. Yeah. How would you say this holds up compared to uh, Jackie Chan Adventures? You say. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what? Do we have- <laughs> The Are we last, not all well versed on our archaeology shows? Oh, you got some moss right here. Oh yeah, that's I that's on purpose. Moss, that's Jack. on purpose. Okay, that's yeah. on purpose. Oh, no, the last Jackie Chan for the film I saw was was that dreadful remake of the Karate Kid. Oh, oh he wow. was in that. He was. He was yeah, the guy. He was, he was Mr. Mr. <laughs> Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi. Oh, oh, oh. Hollywood's Orientalism at work. Is yeah, that, huh? yeah, it's really. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't like it, but I did watch with my son. We watched the whole Cobra Kai thing, which I actually thought was hilarious. Yeah. Oh yeah, because yeah. that's good my things. generation. I heard good things. It's exactly yeah. my. End. It's it's actually pretty funny. How's uh that's How's Ralphie doing, Ralph Macchio? Same, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're all the same. same. How's he doing? I don't know. He seems like <laughs> last time I spoke, no, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> no, it's the other guy, Zabka, uh-huh. the blonde guy. Yeah, mm-hmm. he clearly, apparently, it started with a, a YouTube uh, parody yeah. of the thing, which was like, right. Daniel yeah. is the real bully. Right. right. So they flipped the script. Oh yeah. And made all the good characters evil and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And then he basically turned that into a six part series. <laughs> that's amazing. You know what that's that's funny. I wrote on a I don't know if that's just like a broader trend in entertainment right now. I wrote mm-hmm. on the Save by the Bell reboot. Mm-hmm. And one of the one of the other writers started this series called Zach Morris's Trash. Zach was the like the little blonde kid. In the new in the reboot he is now the governor. Uh, He's okay. defunded the uh, school, in, a uh, black school in California, and that's how they diversify mm. the uh, the Bayside <laughs> in the new reboot. It's all in a, they wow. made him evil. I don't have Saved by the Bell lore, unfortunately. I I was hoping. I don't know. I had hope. I didn't. (laughs) You would be with me, maybe. I don't know. I'm not a bellhead. I'll kill him. Bell nut. I'm not a bell end. On on archaeology, you mentioned being in worse conditions than this. Mm -hmm. Like, I I was wondering if there was like a really, like a memorable site that you were on that was. Oh, God, there's so many. Uh, Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, It's weird because. British universities are very different from American campuses in this respect. Mm-hmm. If you want to take students on some archaeological dig mm-hmm. in the back of beyond, they're just yeah. like, take my children. You know, yeah. <laughs> this is something to do with the empire. I think it's like this uh-huh. mentality of like, mm-hmm. you know, you just yeah, take them to the Sahara. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no insurance, no, <laughs> <laughs> no liability. <laughs> Whereas you know, if you were doing that with 
you or someone like that, presumably you'd, you'd be terrified of yeah. <laughs> getting mm-hmm. sued or whatever. So you, right. you, you can go out, at least until recently, you could go out to places where you've got a reasonable chance of getting bitten by a scorpion or you know dehydrating to the point of collapse. And right. I remember one uh, project that was on years ago, over 20 years ago or something, in eastern Turkey, actually, right, right near mm-hmm. the epicenter of where all the... Uh, right. The quakes have been um, recently, and we were staying in this tiny Kurdish village. Actually, it's, it's that mm-hmm. from like east of Marash. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy in the village uh, whose nickname was Agrab, which means scorpion in Turkey, because mm-hmm. the story goes this guy used to drink a lot of uh, raki. It's like mm-hmm. an anise-based. It's a spirit, a mm-hmm. local local brew, and he drank so much of this stuff that he got bitten by a scorpion and the scorpion died. <laughs> that's the... So his wow. nickname was... Agra. That's the tail. Wow. That's, that's the, the sting that's in the badass. tail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So and right. this inspired the Scorpion King with Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. uh-huh. I remember being... I was on a project in Sudan really in the... So a lot of... A lot of archaeological work in reality, unlike in the movies, is actually generated by capitalist industry right, state right, initiative so right. it's often when they're building a new hydraulic dam over the nile or something they're actually clearing out living populations and resettling people right. to flood the area and in the process they're destroying hundreds of archaeological sites so the archaeologists often get called in to do what they call salvage work basically documenting it before it all goes underwater uh, so we were doing one of these on the fourth cataract. It's bleaker than what you think. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's, not, it's not romantic. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. Like this not. place wasn't romantic. Right, right. The fourth cataract of the Nile is very remote. And you just walk a little bit away from the Nile Valley and you are in deep Sahara. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, uh, that's no joke. And also, it's very malarial. So mm-hmm. we're taking larium, which can drive you a bit nuts. You get paranoid, and you're in a small group. And, yeah, this does uh, not sound sexy at all. Larry David. No. <laughs> this is not. No, <laughs> and yeah. there are no talisman yeah. of any kind involved. Right. This is, uh, <laughs> it, it, just, it must be. It must be infuriating. Uh, the the lens through which uh, media depicts uh, right art. does yeah. that infuriate you because it's like no. i mean i've heard you know, we're the same as everyone else i think a lot of right. people my generation they saw that stuff and they liked it and that's probably part of the reason why they might have inspired got an idea yeah. that you know i don't yeah like i wish it was more I don't like get Indiana upset Jones. at all by that I, I, I do get a little bit upset when you get the kind of um conspiracy theory stuff which portrays people like me yeah. like mm. we're hiding the truth right <laughs> like, I, I like you, already... you planted the dinosaur bones type <laughs> right. thing right, right. <laughs> like, say, yeah, like, like satan yes so. sweating my ass off in the sahara <laughs> yeah. right. so that i can hide the truth right <laughs> <laughs> Right. Oh fuck! We gotta hide this cat <laughs> human thing. Right. 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 That. Right. 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 It's just right. slightly annoying. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Dude, we found all these dragon bones. Yeah. I don't know what to do with these. I found, yeah. an, right. I found an imprint of an old snail. No one can see this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No right. one can see this sea urchin. It's like, oh yeah, Lo- Loch Ness. That was it. we found that. <laughs> we found that a long time ago. I remember once I was supervising a dig, and there were three young guys from Texas. Who mm-hmm. were there for this? Already a bad combination. <laughs> 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 so like, Texas yeah. is going to be relevant. <laughs> yeah. They, they were off the leash because I think they're probably still too young to drink at home. Uh, but they drank and drank and drank. They used to show up drunk on the site. And I remember going and uh, sort of peering, what? peering over the trench <laughs> as these three guys and saying, say, okay, uh, what have you found today? And one of them just looked up at me and he said, David, we found Satan. <laughs> another time they found Whoa. another time they found the stables where the pink unicorns lived <laughs> I don't know they what must have been off that what did you say it was lanium larium larium uh, <laughs> they must have yeah. been off that they were probably on mescaline or something. Yeah, I right. like, <laughs> that sounds yeah. like someone like in the bush in Vietnam would say their sergeant like found yeah. Satan yeah. 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 by that yeah. reason yeah. found yeah, Satan right. they're just talking <laughs> in metaphors yeah. Yeah. that'd be a great footnote to the books like and the guys who found this were fucked up <laughs> yeah. Yeah. they were drunk <laughs> right. Right. which yeah. is generally true <laughs> Did, what, what, what year was that what year was that by the way 
what the Satan the, guy? Yeah, yeah, that whole situation. I can't remember. <laughs> this oh, okay. was like I used to do before I had kids. This was just part of my uh, part of my life cycle. I used to go out pretty much every summer and do field work, mostly in the Middle East or North Africa. And then I did one thing that was pretty challenging. That was down in a tiny country called Lesotho, mm -hmm. so between KwaZulu Natal and South Africa, and we were up in the highlands of Lesotho, which are gorgeous and this beautiful landscape, but they are cowboys. They're like ranchers and they mm -hmm. ride around with these ponchos and uh, the boys fight, you know, they're herding the cattle and then they fight with these sticks and there's rock art. There's these incredible rock paintings and it's very, at the now there's some tourism there. I think they even have skiing up there or something. So they get people coming over from South Africa. When we were there, it was very remote. It's the, uh, the river Limpopo. Mm -hmm. And it was tough because in the nighttime it's freezing. So your tent freezes over. And then in the daytime it gets up to like 40 degrees or something like mm -hmm. that. But while I was there, I didn't really connect with like the lead archaeologist. I was very young at the time. I think I was doing my master's degree or something. Right. And uh, for various reasons, I wanted out after like six weeks of this, I was losing my mind. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for me, I left the project and started walking to a, over a mountain to a place called Sahong Hong, which is where they have the only airstrip. It's the only way out. And you come down onto this. If you've ever flown in one of those little planes and then it lands on this tiny airstrip and you're like, this is pretty uh -huh. scary. <laughs> anyway, while I'm on my way up there, unbeknownst to me, they start a revolution, uh, which happened periodically there. They tried to overthrow King Mashweshwe mm -hmm. and they closed the border. And I think some diplomat got killed at the border or something. So I show up in Sahong Hong. Obviously, the only white guy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, like, this is uh, the new king? This right. the new guy? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, discover that the country is sort of collapsing. And uh, the way I got out, there were uh, uh, two Afrikaners, two white guys flew. They had a little aeroplane. And they looked at me and they were like, get in. <laughs> get, get in here. So I got in with these two unpleasant guys and they flew me over to a town oh, called no. Bloemfontein on the other side of the border where I basically sat and waited for the rest of the guys to hopefully show up, which they did eventually. And then the director of the project, there was a professor at Oxford, and I've never spoken to him since. <laughs> he, uh, he blamed me for not getting a visa. It was like I border hopped. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> they just killed someone at the border and you want me to go and get right. visa, yeah so. that's where they fucking do's up I don't want to. yeah wow. priorities but it was you yeah, know in yeah. retrospect though i admire the guy because actually to take a bunch of obnoxious yeah. young people like me out to a place like that and i've done it like later in life i had to direct my own mm -hmm. projects and it's a lot of pressure yeah actually mm -hmm. uh, so he was probably just freaking out in general yeah, I should cut the guy some slack. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call him. <laughs> <laughs> I should call. Him. Hey, sorry, yeah, I miss him, man. <laughs> oh, that's oh, cool. I'm not gonna cool. lie, I, I really want to hear more about your experience with theater, theater. Like, yeah, mm. yeah. Just mm. like, what theatrical productions in, inspired you? We've all done theater oh, in some way shape or form We're all yeah yeah boys um i feel like i'm almost going back to it these days because of this yeah. book which i wrote with my mm -hmm. friend david you know mm -hmm. uh, i have to be on call a lot yeah. <laughs> and do, right. do stuff that is not right <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly the kind of stuff i wanted right. to get away from <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but no that was my uh my first love really i was a pretty shy kid Mm -hmm. yeah. But and I've always maintained that the, the best actors are not extroverts. Mm -hmm. They're not actually the ones who are in your face all the time. They're yeah. often actually very introverted people. Mm -hmm. yeah. But something happens when they get a script and they go up there like there's some whatever. Yeah. So I think around the age of fourteen or fifteen, I discovered that I actually like this stuff, and I went in a couple of school productions, and then I joined up with this thing called the National Youth Theatre, mm -hmm. which is the whole of Great Britain. Yeah. And it was amazing because I grew up in London mm. and I imagine it's like growing up in New York. What part of London? North. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, my dad's from the east. I grew up in the north. But Londoners are a bit like New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. We don't. We know the rest of the country is out there, but yeah, we yeah. don't really. <laughs> we like see whatever. them on TV like, occasionally. Not, you know? not, yeah. <laughs> so this thing was amazing because it was the first time I actually met kids from all over the UK, like all different walks of life and backgrounds. Right. So, oh, there are really people who speak with those accents. Yeah. Right. Right. And that was that was interesting. And you had to grow up very quickly. Because certain things you take for granted in a cosmopolitan city. Like, I remember there was one kid who simply would not believe I was Jewish. Because where he grew up, Jews have horns and tails. Huh? I'm not kidding. And there was nothing I could do. He was do. saying that genuinely or as an insult? No, 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 no. I thought he was joking at first. Uh, and it also wasn't like, it didn't feel even anti Semitic. He just genuinely had grown up. Oh, this is, like a, huh. this is in the UK we're talking? Yeah. We have countryside. <laughs> <laughs> we have country folks too. Yeah. 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 And uh, I've just alienated half the people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, don't, they don't watch this. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> some of them do. 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 Some of them But no, he just, you know, he inspected me and everything is no way. And there's nothing I could do yeah. to convince this kid. He thought I was having him on. Oh. So it's an eye opener. You what? know, it's interesting. <laughs> He's like, I feel like he was doing satire or something. No, like no, he no. He's he, like, he, he, like, he, 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 he thought Jewish people were like griffins or something. Like a, like yeah. a cryptozoological. You just, you just keep like, <laughs> so you can retract the horns. Is that right? Yeah. Like, yeah. They're, they're, like, not, they're like Wolverine. Like really it's not, it's like not that legend. different if you, uh, I was in uh, Warsaw few years back mm -hmm. where you know they don't really have jews anymore not many <laughs> but they have like toy jews in the shops and they're like mm -hmm. they're all like little religious figures and they like, look the like little, dwarfs or fairies like the little homie toys that were in yeah the machines. it's like you know these supernatural creatures maybe used to exist or something <laughs> it's very odd it's Europe just <laughs> baffles me. Yeah, it's so it's many crazy, different yeah. levels. We talk about this. It's, yeah, like, Europe is just so different. baffling. It's crazy. Yeah. Like they have the same but different. They have like mm. people from Disney movies and shit. It's weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But no, I loved it, and and I used to go and do that every summer. And when I left school, uh, that's what I did. I, I I got an agent somehow or another, and I I started going to auditions, and that's uh, that's the first thing I did, and I was doing pretty well. I even got a film role in something. Uh, it was filmed in Paris mainly, and I was 18 years old. And they flew me over to Paris. What window of time? What years are are, are these? Oh God. Is... Okay, so I got to warn you. This is a problem when you do archaeology for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm really good on long chronology, right? But I have <laughs> right. no idea what happened yesterday. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I can right. tell you like 5,000 BC. I've got it all down. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so, so about the 1980s, I draw right. a blank. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> right. That makes sense uh, to me. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, I guess this must have been late. Okay, I'm born 72, 82. Yeah, late 80s. Okay. Early okay. 90s, something okay. like that. So it was actually going pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but you then. Just, the mic. Just want to make sure oh, we, yeah, we, we hear you. Oh, that's you. okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I decided uh, a bit conventionally that I ought to study. So I enrolled for a, a degree, which was at drama school, mm -hmm. like split between a university and a drama school. So there's two big drama schools in mm -hmm. London, the mm -hmm. famous ones. There's Rada and Central. Rada was John Gielgud. And in the old days, it was all about speaking verse. And, this mm -hmm. sort of, and Rada was Laurence Olivier, mm -hmm. who at the time mm -hmm. was like the closest thing they had to Stanislavski or whatever. Right. They, you, uh -huh. know, you had to yeah. actually sort of, had to be authentic. Or yeah. Right. And you had to right. do blackface. And uh, yeah, yeah, all that, all that right. real, keeping right. it right. real, yeah. Yeah. real theater, yeah. real theater, yeah, yeah. yeah. right, raw, yeah. give it to you, right. raw, right. Yeah. I assume it's his Othello that we're doing, right? Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Mm. <laughs> but I'll continue. So Olivier was yeah, your biggest so I inspiration. Was... <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> you're inspired by him. This is you guys. Yeah. Uh, he was, it's just the logical extension <laughs> of his whole philosophy. Right. 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 Of course. I need to know how this feels. Of course. Of course. Um, <laughs> yeah, that didn't age well. Um, <laughs> right. No. Uh, yeah, and that didn't go so well because mm. they wanted to kind of break you down and mm. make you into an actor and mm. i didn't I, it wasn't me i yeah. was just very kind of a bit boring about it i was just like just give me a script yeah. and then mm. i'll go and act you yeah. know i don't right. want to do the the like introspection and the, yeah. and it all kind of came to a head oh and we had a dance teacher which school by the way you mentioned central two. so this was central, central, central. central. Okay. Okay. in the part of london called swiss cottage mm -hmm. and we had a movement teacher who was this very camp german guy called mm. uh, i forget thomas <laughs> he wanted to go skipping around the <laughs> uh, i just used to sit out and sort of go can we act now or something right, right and it all came to a head at the end of the term they had the big production where they were called agents and right. things i fell out <laughs> and i had the lead on this <laughs> right i actually did have the lead in this play it was some new play <laughs> Not a fella. <laughs> <laughs> Tropic Thunder, the theater production. <laughs> British Tropic Thunder. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another. Okay. Yeah. You've, you've seen the movie. You've seen the movie. Yeah. This is the first time in this conversation I've literally no clue what you're talking about, but that's. Tropic oh, well, Thunder. this is uh, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, doing blackface. But this Do you recall? Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should pull something up. This is. Uh, it's pretty universally accepted as like the only acceptable really? instance of blackface in film. In what? Every time, so every couple of years, somebody brings it up and tries to cancel him for it. Uh -huh. And he has Jamie Foxx sitting next to him and is like, no, it was cool. We all, no, it was cool, it was fine. But is there like an argument so, as to why it's cool? So he's playing, he's playing an Australian man who uh -huh. is going way too far into a role and he gets like, he gets like skin grafting surgery to like uh -huh. install black skin onto his body. <laughs> He's just he's basically so playing, deep in he's character. He's playing a racist. He's person. making fun of. Yeah. He's, yeah. That sounds. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you're on, yeah. on board till you see the end. I, I didn't think I was about to, this. to say. Yeah. I didn't know he was playing. I didn't know the character was Australian. Either. Yeah, that's a new, that's new information. The, uh, oh wow. Yeah. No, I've never seen that. Movie. It's from like 2008. 2008. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that's it was a well, uh, it's not quite the same. I'm sorry, twenty eight. <laughs> anyway, so while time. I was doing that right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. uh yeah, no, we had a uh, it was the, the lady who was directing this this big end of term production. Oh. I just you know how okay, bless you. Mm -hmm. Occasionally you just clash personality. I did mm -hmm. not get on with this person and she yeah hated me and mm -hmm. actually ran into her in the street about 15 years later and we, we like caught each other and the hatred was fresh <laughs> <laughs> wow and she, oh, that's so that funny. beef was in the freezer yeah. right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. it was just frozen and it was thawed out yeah. within seconds yeah <laughs> I have another <laughs> beef was in the freezer. Yeah, it was. Beef was. Yeah. The freezer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's so quick, she, isn't he? Yeah. I tell him that all the time. <laughs> 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 I don't know how he does it. People don't say that. <laughs> Can I finish this story? Yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit traumatic yeah, for me in you know, like, oh, bringing this stuff yeah, right. up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm beefing the Anyways, yeah. uh, Your therapist just laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, the tribulations. <laughs> 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 So we're waiting, I don't know, it's like 30 mm -hmm. minutes till curtain up and yeah. she's doing her usual thing. She's got all the other kids around and they're doing the exercises like the ping pong ball, ping pong ball, mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And I'm just sitting there as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and we start now yeah, and yeah. she lost it. She lost her shit and she was like, David, get down here. I'm not coming down there. Get down here. Mm -mm. And she screamed at me. She was like, get down here now or just get out. So I left. Wow. And I walked out and I'm walking around the streets of Swiss Cottage thinking, I can't let my friends down. You know, what am I going to do? So I went back and I did the thing. 
And then she flunked me. <laughs> and I wow. thought, that's it. I'm out of here. And yeah. You I left cried. theater because of authoritarianism. I left theater because I tried <laughs> to study it instead of actually yeah. doing it, I mm, think. Right. Or maybe if I'd have gone into directing or something, it might have been better. Yeah. And then I uh, I dropped that completely. And I, I tried a whole bunch of other, other things. I oh, kept yeah. doing it a little bit later on after I started mm -hmm. start actually studying a degree seriously. Right. Uh, I had a friend, I used to show up, at, uh, I was at Oxford University, mm -hmm. and I found this guy who was perfect. His name was Brett Drennan, I think. <laughs> and he, this was pr still pre-digital, so we didn't have emails or phones or anything. Mm -hmm, right. So I would just show up and there'd just be a little note in my pigeonhole at the start of term saying, uh, I'm creating a production of a fellow <laughs> you know, would you like to play blah, blah, blah. and I could just show up and do the script but then I realized that was all going wrong too yeah. actually the last thing I ever did was a complete disaster and then I realized I have to stop yeah there's a tiny theater in um in Oxford called the Burton Taylor Theatre, mm -hmm. which Richard and Liz donated. It's actually a bit disappointing considering how much money they had at the time. <laughs> so, small theatre. And I was in this slightly ridiculous production that this this girl had, had written and designed. And it was all a bit sort of abstract. It was the kind of <laughs> stuff I hate. <laughs> and I had a bit of an issue with drink at the time. And I think the last performance was going to be a midnight show mm -hmm. so, and we hadn't had good audiences so I assume nobody's gonna come mm. so I went to the pub and at about 11 30 p.m. someone comes rushing and says David David we've got 30 people in the thing and I'm already like pretty far gone <laughs> you're about to go <laughs> on a dig <laughs> yeah, exactly. so I make my way to the theater and put on my funny cloud costume or whatever the hell I was wearing and I just all I can remember is going onto the stage I had to sit on a bench next to an actress and I remember looking up and the audience was just doing this and the next thing I remember is just her hand smashing me across the face <laughs> wow and I think the director stood up in the audience and goes, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, all right, enough's enough, Dave. You know, okay. Just pack that's, it that's in. Yeah. That's, that's dramatic. That's I went out on a yeah. real low. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, thematically, story-wise, it's yeah. a high. I call it. Yeah. yeah, I still feel so. Do you yeah. still follow happenings in the world of theater or film? Or no, anything? but I do enjoy it. You know, occasionally I'll run into somebody who's in that world and mm -hmm. i always enjoy talking to them and you know i always feel a connection with that definitely yeah do you like uh you know mike lee the director sure do you like any of his movies oh yeah i feel like you like he should cast you in a movie i feel like you'd be is a he good... still making films he's still yeah going on. Uh, he is the last couple have been like period pieces but right like those kind of like uh, everyday life. Yeah, yeah, films. yeah. No, like... there was one. I'm trying to remember the name. Timothy Spall yeah. is in it. Yeah, he's often he often casts yeah, Timothy he's a, Spall. He's always, yeah. Yeah. And uh, actually, he used to drink in a pub in in North London where his wife. What's his wife's name? She's a well known. Well -known. Secrets and Lies, which are secrets friend? and. How did yeah. you know? I just looked it up. Yeah, yeah, Secrets and Lies. Yeah. It's from the nineties. Nineteen ninety six. Yeah, that He's film great in that. blew me away. Yeah, it's just yeah. it was just so, and it's quite like it's not a million miles from the kind of uh, setting I grew up in, mm -hmm. and it is just brutally. It's about families basically, mm -hmm. and how incredibly fucked up they are, mm -hmm. and it all comes out at the end. And Timothy Spall's got this speech mm -hmm. at the end where he's the guy who's always holding it together. Mm -hmm. and sucking up everyone else's shit right and then in the end he just cracks yeah, and cracks. It's, it's so powerful yeah. and yeah I, I think he does that so well Mike Lee yeah mm -hmm. I think he's also in Life is Sweet as like a older brother or something and like a totally different character but right Secrets and Lies he's that's know, a great that movie yeah. and there's uh yeah. there's like a scene where they work at like a like a portrait studio and a guy comes in drunk and they like calm him down and they get him to leave it's like really beautiful it's just yeah. like very simple kind of everyday life stuff yeah. but yeah like would you act in film like would you be in one of his movies 
Is that a? I'm oh, asking, is that, 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 that a role that kind of bugs you? <laughs> <laughs> well, or just even bro- broadening it out, like as a perf- you still have like yeah, a like performer. Yeah. What kind of roles do you of, prefer? Like, like to step into someone else's. I don't. I don't think I, I wanted. I was. I remember being really struck uh, when I was sort of falling out of love with the whole thing. Mm. Uh, there was a, a very good biography of the act, the, the Welsh actor Richard Burton, same mm-hmm. Richard Burton, uh, where he he was reflecting on his life and how humiliating he f- he felt it was to have spent most of his adult life uttering words written by other, other men yeah, other yeah. People. You know? yeah. and uh yeah i, I get that uh, yeah it's a so <laughs> like, no, like, no. Yeah. no yeah no, no, a, I, what if you what if you wrote what if you wrote it though would you perform something you wrote no, why do you want to make me do I don't, I don't, I don't feel, I feel no we're inclination. We're casting a film right now. Actually, we're working on it. Oh, oh yeah. okay. No, no <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm doing a comeback. Yeah. It's not happening. But no, I get what I, you're saying. There's like My a... IMBD is very <laughs> short and yeah. it's staying that way. <laughs> I do relate to that feeling though. I've like, I've been in a couple things Same. myself. And also, like, mm. I mean, particularly like, Theater not so much doesn't mm-hmm. bother me so much, but like being recorded on film, it's gonna be right. out forever. Knowing mm. you How had no you... control of your image in this instance, no. it's yeah. like right. there's yeah. something itchy about it over a long period yeah, yeah, of time. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. How do you cope with auditions? Because I also I was so I've... not cut out for this. You no, know? this no. was the wrong profession for me, and yeah. it's good that I got out of it because I used to find auditions humiliating. I yeah, it's have, degrading. I've I used to walk that. out of things. I yeah. probably alienated half the casting agents in Soho yeah. before I even turned 20 because i just mm-hmm. wouldn't do things yeah you're so authoritarian yeah right you do this you do that right i've stopped replying to those emails i don't right. i don't do them mm-hmm. anymore um, i remember showing up to an audition actually this is kind of cool because the director was john g avildsen as in rocky <laughs> that uh-huh. guy you know? uh-huh. so i got to meet john g avildsen i have no idea why i was at this audition it was for some musical or something and i told my agent that and I'd, I had a day job. I was working in the post room of some big company. So we just had we were the post boys had to run around and yeah. put letters in boxes and things. So I was pretty exhausted by the end of the day. I showed up to this audition. I told the agent that I will read and I will sing, but I don't dance. <laughs> 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 she said, okay, okay, you go along, you go along. And I mm-hmm. sat in this audition room actually with two guys who became quite well known afterwards. One had a, a, a career which went like, whoosh, woo! <laughs> <laughs> a guy called Chesney Hawks, and he had this one song that was very famous. Uh, he was, I think he was the son of Chip Hawks, who was in a very famous 60s band called the Tremolos. And okay. Chip was there with his no, the boy. Tremolos, I didn't. That was a yeah. British thing. But, um, them, yeah. And there was another guy called Charlie Creed Miles, the, the, there was a movie recently. We watched it recently on Netflix. Uh, uh, Creed could, Miles? Yeah, he always used to show up at my auditions. They must have thought we were sort of vaguely similar looking or something. Yeah. And it's the, the, the poster is like him with his fists, like Wild Bill. It's a film called Wild Bill. <laughs> and as, so I used to have to sort of go up against this guy in auditions occasionally. And he would try. He and was in The of, Fifth Element. There you oh, go. He looks, he looks so familiar. I'll oh, see if I can wow. pull up. This. He's a good actor. Yeah. Uh, he's probably watching this. <laughs> <laughs> but he would, you know what actors are like. When you want that yeah. role, you will stop at nothing. Oh, yeah. So, you know, there's little intimidation tactics yeah. that go on. So there was a bit of that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they go in for the casting and they come out one by one and their faces are like red. And it's like, I don't know what they're doing to them in there, but I really, you know. And uh, he went in and and I said, I'm not, yeah, oh, that's wow. him. Hello. <laughs> Long time. Is there, a, <laughs> um, is there a Devo scene? What has happened there? <laughs> I don't know. He, he's, this, is a, this is a Devo cover band. Is he's the is. guy in the movie who like, I think he's even in the ending where they're like pouring the stuff on the stone oh. and they're all like relieved because the oh, world yeah, and then, well, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. He was yeah. also, oh, wow. pe- did, did you guys get Peaky Blinders? Yeah. 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 So he was yeah. the guy, uh, Bill <laughs> K- Kimball or whatever, and Billy Kimball. In the okay. First one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a good actor, but yeah. um, 
So they'd all go in, and I'd already like made a point. I'm, I'm not, I'm not dancing. I said, I, whatever you're doing, I'm right. not doing it. You know. Mm -hmm. So when I went in, they all like pressed their faces up against the door to see if I'd crack. <laughs> 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 and uh, did the audition with uh, you know a bit of singing, a bit of reading, and so on. And then the woman says, okay, and where's your tape? We were still on cassette tapes. <laughs> where's your tape to do your 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 dance? So I said, no, I, I told my agent, I'm not not dancing. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, and w w you don't have a tape. All right, we'll play some Kylie Minogue, and and you, I'm like, <laughs> and they're looking in chat. That guy. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> you know? All right, no, no, that's that's not happening. Yeah. And um, and then she said to me, I don't remember. It's funny the things that stick in your head. She said you've wasted my time. She said to me, and I lost it because I've been at work all day. And right. Like, wow. No, you fucking right. wasted my time. And it's like, right. And of course, she's like one of the most powerful casting agents so i storm <laughs> out of there and, yeah. but i kept my dignity yeah, yeah. that's oh yeah. yeah it wasn't for yeah. me it was right for me. yeah it's, it's it's not for most i feel yeah. like it's not built for it. normal for yeah. humans <laughs> yeah. I, it's yeah. like so dehumanizing i did it long enough every audition i go to it would be like five comedians that i know mm -hmm. personally <laughs> like be me seaton smith Derek Gaines, people y'all y'all don't know them by name but it would be those two people, uh, a bunch of tall black men that look with mm. afros <laughs> for a role that says Donald Glover type, and then oh man, and then you look over, yeah. and then you look over, yeah. and you see Donald Glover there, and you're like, well, he's gonna get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I, uh, no. you know, no. That's I, fucking hilarious. I legit no. had I had one audition where this was the most dehumanizing That's thing so I've ever degrading. had. Where mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was testing for a pilot um for i want to say this was abc mm -hmm. um got very far along in the process they flew me out to la and i was at a point i couldn't afford to pay the deposit at the hotel mm -hmm. i uh i'm like calling my dad like hey could i get like 100 something like this amount of money for the deposit and uh i'm just sitting in a hotel room by myself there's no like per there is a per diem, but they're like, yeah, we'll we'll give it to you. Like, like they're trying to do a net thirty on a per diem or some right. shit. And um, and I remember like this the whole process. The director had to told me that he wanted to book me, but it was also his first pilot, so mm -hmm, he had mm -hmm. no control in the audition process. They had sent me a tape of a friend of mine because his audition was what they wanted. And they were like, mm -hmm. well, just do it like the way he did it. And it's like, well, he's going to get the role. Like, just book him. <laughs> you like him, just book right. him. And they put took me through this whole rigmarole, had me in the hotel for two days. Mm -hmm. They extended my stay for an extra day. So I'm sitting here like, okay, so the test went well. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Surely I've got this role. And then I get a call the next day like, yeah, they went with your fucking friend that's how they said it they were like, <laughs> your fucking they went friend. with your fucking friend you know how you know what it is yeah yeah, yeah it's a bit brutal yeah it's yeah. and that was one of those things that just was like why why am i gonna keep doing this for something mm -hmm. that in the end is just gonna like make me feel bad even if i get sure. it you know i have one thing though which is weird because it's like uh, art imitating or art anticipating life mm -hmm. i got cast in a, a very glitzy kind of mini series which is a dramatization of the life of the warburg family so sigmund warburg which is like big german financiers mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. but they also included uh, 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 abby warburg who was this slightly uh, brilliant but but actually crazy i mean he ended up in a sanatorium but he had this theory basically about what he called the pagan roots of european culture and the renaissance mm -hmm. and a lot of it is slightly mystical but also mm -hmm. very brilliant he's like a bit like a sort of walter benjamin type uh, thinker mm -hmm. uh, slightly esoteric but brilliant anyway so i'm in a dramatization of this thing Charlie showed up at the audition. I got the role. Seriously, scoreboard. Scoreboard. No, that actually happened. I remember he was there, and I got cast in as the the lead guy, Sigmund, but the young Sigmund, oh, okay. and the old Sigmund was an American, well-known American actor called Sam Waterston. Oh, he got wow. the Oscar yeah. for The Killing Fields, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. right. And there were some incredible actors in this thing, uh, but international. 
like continental. There was a guy called Otto Talzig, who must be long dead, who was Austrian, mm-hmm. my mother's side Austrian, and he uh, he was actually in Bertolt Brecht's original Berlin Ensemble. <laughs> this guy and he was playing uh, Abby Warburg and there's a scene oh also the, my father was played by a brilliant French actor called Jean-Pierre Cassel who is Vincent Cassel's dad oh, really? Never, we were in oh. Turin the other week and I saw a picture of Vincent in the window mm-hmm. uh, I think it was the Prada shop. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was like, oh, that guy, where do I know that? Because I haven't seen his movie, but he was in this thing too. Right. Mm. He had a smaller role than me. I always point this out. Uh-huh. Um, but <laughs> there's a scene in, in this thing where I'm in the library, Abby Warburg's library, with this Austrian actor playing Abby Warburg, and I'm mm-hmm. playing the young Sigmund, and he's sort of initiating me into the uh, the mad world of his library and showing me pictures of Botticelli's Primavera, explaining the symbolism. Mm-hmm. And probably roughly like 10 years after that, I actually became a research fellow in the real Warburg Institute, wow. which when the Nazis took over, they moved it from Hamburg to London. Mm-hmm. So it was a really odd kind of yeah, uh, right. journey, um, which always ended up there. So, you know, I actually had some pretty cool experiences as a young yeah. man, and I, you know, I got to travel a bit yeah, and get away from home. On that, you kind of spoke to it the other night um, at that event. At um, the but, gallery. Yeah. Mm. But it would be cool to hear you just sort of elaborate more on how you basically stumbled into <laughs> the archaeological oh, yeah. field. It really was just, a yeah. bit of a stumble. Yeah, uh, I was watching it. What yeah. happened was basically I I, uh, I did the acting and mm-hmm. then I, I tried various things and I bummed around in, in a lot of jobs. And there was actually a, an economic depression, mm-hmm. a recession in the UK at that time. So it was quite difficult to even get temporary what we call temping jobs like on a right. on post office or a building right. site or whatever so right. i was just at a loose end but i had good grades from school and i had one uh, uh, professor at the place i flunked out of who said you know you should go to oxford you should go to the best best place you can so i wrote to all these oxford colleges uh, asking to to do english literature right and i got nothing back and a friend of mine told me it might be easier to get in if you choose a subject which is a bit less like off the beaten track, right. less right. in demand. And they just started a new program, archaeology and anthropology. Mm-hmm. And I wrote to one college, St. Hugh's College, saying, can I come and do that? And I got an interview. So I show up to this interview um, and there's a very formidable lady called Barbara Kennedy, a geographer. Mm-hmm. who's interviewing me. We became friends uh, years later, but it was a tough interview. And, you know, she let me go on about my great passion for archaeology. Since I was <laughs> um, bullshit completely. Mm-hmm. And then to my horror, she reached down and produced from under her chair all the letters I'd written to other colleges saying, can I come and do English <laughs> literature? <laughs> so I thought, well, that's all over now. Yeah. And then she, she admitted me. She let me in. And so I, I, I showed up. This is in my early 20s. And I was saying I had a, a bit of a problem with drink at that mm-hmm. time. I didn't know how to drink. I mean, I, I knew how to drink. But I didn't know how to drink. <laughs> yeah. So I would get into trouble. And uh, I didn't have to drink in moderation. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't grasp the sort of rather feudal system of the Oxford colleges. So mm-hmm. I came, and you know, the first thing that happens at these places is you show up as a, a student. Right. I think I was already technically classified as a mature student because I was 23 or something. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that happens is you get invited to all these drinks parties. Mm-hmm. So I'm out there <laughs> <laughs> socializing, right. right. educating myself. Mm-hmm. And I got back to the college and um, there was a girl I fancied who worked in the kitchen mm-hmm. of the college. So I saw she was there and I just went and started chatting her up. Mm-hmm. It was going quite well as far as I remember. And then the head kitchen lady came out and said, you cannot be here. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, it's all right. I've got a room just up there and I'm a student here. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, you, you must leave immediately. And uh, this is not what you expected. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, I already had a few friends and, and uh, they were sort of waiting outside the kitchen and I'm not going anywhere. And she says, all right, I'm going to call the porter. I made that face too. I don't know what the portal is <laughs> or anything. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Anyway, this guy shows up, uh, Martin, who again I, be I became friends with all these people later on. And a lot of the porters are ex-military, and they're, they're the guys who stand at the gate basically okay. and sort of oh, okay. see people in and out. I was gonna mm -hmm. say a porter is also a beer. That sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so there's Martin, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I'm clearly not going anywhere and the ladies of the kitchen are standing around so he starts getting a bit embarrassed and he doesn't know what to do mm -hmm. and he, he grabbed me like this and I, <laughs> and I hit him and then we ended up on the floor in one of those pathetic kind of man <laughs> fights where you just like, and I remember sort of glancing over and there's there's my friends outside the kitchen looking and going what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> What's Dave doing? <laughs> anyway, come look at this. <laughs> so, I, you know, eventually we sort of got up and said, oh, see you in the morning sort of thing. And I, I went to bed and then in the morning I get this knock at the door and there's this little schnip in a gown. You know, they wear the Harry Potter gown. They say, you must come and see the D. <laughs> I don't know what you What's the D? So we go to the office of this man who I swear was an alcoholic he had a half bottle empty bottle of scotch on the table and he told me uh, you are a bad a bad hobbit <laughs> you are you are banned banned from the college bar forever and, wow. and he wow. gave me a fine no it was a suspended fine but it was like a lot of money in relative terms and then all these little assholes in the college, the students <laughs> I'm referring to, started like, it be I became like an urban myth. It was like stories <laughs> would circulate Over about the, kitchen the guy who punched the porter. Yeah. <laughs> so I would come back to college and there would be these stories circulating. And eventually I got the letter from Barbara saying, um, look, you've got to go on the wagon so that we know these stories are not true. Just like stop shitting on your own, she didn't use that expression. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Basically stop shitting on your own doorstep mm -hmm, or we're right. gonna throw you out. Getting pissed as they say. Getting is pissed. That, is, that, is that highly profane to say it like that? No, it's fine. No. Okay. I don't know if it's like <laughs> blood. Bloody, I don't know, you know, I don't know. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Some of these things meet, have weight to Getting them. Getting pissed. Yeah, getting and pissed. I did I actually, pissed, I remember I got into trouble. They have a lot of problems there with what they call town and gown, mm. which is familiar from the Ivy Leagues in the US. You know, it's like that other movie with the, what is it? Was it Matt Damon? I can't remember. It's not a bad uh, film. I watched it on an Google airplane hunting? recently. I was going to say Hunting. Good mm. hunting yeah. That kind of town yeah. and gown thing. Right. And I got in a fight in a pub in Oxford with a local guy who was a oh, car mechanic. Yeah. I don't know what the hell I was doing. Actually, it's the pub. It's called The Eagle and Child, and it's where Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, you know, they had that group called The Inklings, mm -hmm. and they used to tell each other stories, and that's how they made up Narnia and Middle Earth. That was their pub. It's a famous wow. place. Wow. And of all places, I ended up in a, a, a tussle there, and I, I broke my finger on this guy's chin, and I remember they had to cut my granddad's ring off, and I had a bad black eye, and I sort of come back to college. And they were, it is a bit like that good black <laughs> wow. So, you know, they, with good reason, they probably wanted to get rid of me. But I had one professor, wonderful guy, called Andrew Sherratt. And I'd already written some uh, what we call essays and what you call term papers or something. Right. And he wrote to the college and uh, I saw the letter years later when I was like, really like a PhD student. And he mm -hmm. said, your ugly duckling is a swan because he yeah. actually put the work first. And I actually always really appreciated that That's about awesome. Oxford, That's... that they, they gave me a chance to figure out the rules because they thought I could do this stuff. Right. And, uh, and yeah, he was the guy who, who really got me hooked on it. And, and yeah. so it was really very, very accidental. Yeah. Right. Just happened to have the right teacher right. who makes you feel, because archaeology in Britain 
it's not really the kind of thing that a Jewish kid from North London is likely to do. It's mm-hmm, very, right. or at least back then, it was very English. So, you know, I would associate it with not the kind of people I would typically hang out with. Right. Like, uh, um, you know what I mean? Are there class, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. a class it's, dynamic to it's what It's very saying? English. Right. Like, it's, right. Ali- it's slightly Cultural alienating that yeah. you feel like, you, you know, because you don't really have any, I don't really yeah. have any roots of that kind in Britain. Right. You know, my mm-hmm. dad's parents came over as refugees and my mum grew up uh, in Europe and uh, yeah, it was kind of intimidating. Right. Right. So I didn't have that sort of natural sense that this is something I could contribute to. But right. he gave me that actually. It's amazing. It's like you were a young Jimmy Fallon. What? Never <laughs> quite thought he's, of it that way. He's that he, yeah. he's that way now. Okay. He's, he's a no, he's a big alcoholic. Were you? He's a known alcoholic. He's uh, the, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, oh, Jimmy Fallon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what? It, you obviously, you're. I'm sure you're Allegedly. a big a big reader. Is there? Mm. You know, is there anything you read nowadays that, you know, do you have the time for it? Or I mean, I, I guess you do with the travel. It's frustrating, actually, um, not really having time to read the way that mm-hmm. I want to read, like to actually think while i read uh, mm. it happens alarmingly rarely these days right. that i actually have time to read and reflect um but i'm gonna get some time off teaching and things next year mm-hmm. but i do a lot of teaching and and uh, i i find myself reading like snatching bits of time in between mm-hmm. things but i'm gonna get some time off next year to 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 not unlike you know, how you school. made this book i mean i have a i have a question yeah. on that though on reading in this book Mm. Because I f- I know a lot of people who they look at that book and they're like I'm not reading all that man right like they they see the because maybe just like you they're super yeah. busy in life or they're they're stressed out they don't they don't feel like they have the mental bandwidth right. to sit and yeah. go through all of and that they don't want to crash their car with the audio book right <laughs> they don't, <laughs> right. don't yeah. want to take the risk right, right. and yeah. I'm I'm also asking this from the place of even me I'm very kind of utilitarian when it comes to mm-hmm. reading I, I mm-hmm. like to read for a very specific point i don't really like to just do it for leisure or yeah. mm-hmm. for status even or something I'm, I'm reading for a point and on that I'm, I'm curious like what you would say to someone who looks at that book and they're interested but they're like i'm not reading all that what's the point and then why like why should i like what's the significance you of know it? and you know i've talked a lot about the dawn of everything so you can imagine yeah. over the last year and a half or something and that has never come up yeah it's almost like the other way around the like the letters I was reading right uh, they read it too many the times. gallery yeah <laughs> people read it and then they mm-hmm. reread it and these are not necessarily people with college educations mm-hmm. the thing is none of this is is or should be particularly surprising and you know my my friend and co-author David was was insistent on this is mm-hmm. is that actually uh, your regular reader is often a closer reader and you know, yeah. they'll go into mm-hmm. the footnotes. Right. Academics can be very sloppy readers because right. they're so into their thing that you, you read with blinkers on. Mm-hmm. You know, you're looking for that thing that confirms or disputes right. what you're, you're not open quite a lot of the time. And I'm not, you know, David was, um, I think his, his parents were, um, they were definitely well-read people, mm-hmm. but they're from working class backgrounds. Mm-hmm. We didn't have books at home except football biographies and a few things like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I went to a good school uh, at some point and so did he. But we're not from, I'm not, uh, always got a laugh, you know, on social media. Sometimes people, I am the first in my family to get a PhD or something. (laughs) I think I'm the first in my family to finish high school, actually. So neither of us... uh, come from that you know generations of highly educated people Mm -hmm. or whatever right and i think you do have a on the one hand you have a slight insecurity because of that you never quite feel like you fit in Mm -hmm. to the academic world and on the other hand though you know that people are not stupid right (laughs) right you know you know your grandparents or whatever you know they're smart people uh, and I'm really proud, actually, that our book came in at number two on the New York Times yeah. bestseller, just under Will Smith. <laughs> and it's a 700-page tome with yeah. a 70-page bibliography. Right. And right. I love that because it just gives the lie to this 
bullshit that if you want to write a popular nonfiction, you've got to yeah. dumb down and like right. make right. it like a kid's story or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, in my case, it was like, this is a little bit my mind playing tricks, but like seeing the title and being like the dawn of everything. I'm like, thank God it's all in one place, <laughs> finally. You know? <laughs> Even though yeah. I know. Part yeah, of me yeah, like, hey, it's 500 it, pages, final. but. It's... We've had everything for a long time. <laughs> Thank I, God somebody. We had a lot of trouble uh, finding a title. Actually, when David passed away, we still didn't have a title. Oh, wow. We'd gone through at least 50 really bad titles. <laughs> um, Can you name uh, your least favorite ones? Well, or your favorite other ones? The know. one I remember that, that we would have loved, but the publishers would never. You know the Bruno Latour book, uh, We've Never Been Modern? It's a philosophy book. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to call ours, We've Never Been Stupid. <laughs> Subtitle, Until Now. <laughs> <laughs> we had all kinds yeah. of ridiculous titles. Sounds like a Bill Maurer book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We had like, yeah, yeah. humans are I not we had, people. Uh, <laughs> we had fu <laughs> fucked the last 50,000 years. <laughs> oh, yeah. Obviously a riff on yeah. debt. Oh, uh, wow. Right. We yeah. had terrible titles, none of which uh, were fun, any though. good. Yeah. David's yeah. favorite was The Dawn of Everything, but he was convinced the publishers would never let us use it because it's so ridiculous. Right. So he created a hashtag on Twitter. He said, we'll just start using it. It'll become like a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. And when he passed away, uh, I got copied into an email thread between the publishers and the agents or whatever. And the obituaries were coming out in the newspaper and they wanted people to know about the new book because that's what publishers think about, I guess. And they were panicking like, oh, we don't have a title. We don't have a title. So I just jumped in and I said, well, David wanted to call it the dawn of everything. Oh. And he's just died, so what could they say? So that's how I got it under the line. <laughs> wow. Now they like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Right. And he was right. I think it, it, it works. You know, it captures something about um, the point right. of the book. And, right. you know, I wanted to say on the, on the question about, you know, someone who's like, I'm not going to read all of that. Mm. I've, I've learned in my experience, there's just so many different types of ways in which people learn and receive information in general. Mm. I personally deal with a lot of people that really don't like to read or they struggle mm -hmm. to fo to focus mm -hmm. when they're reading. And I find the ways in which I can more organically get people mm -hmm. passionate or engaged is by, you know, putting something, it might be provocative to them even what I'm saying, mm -hmm. but it makes them go, okay, but why? And then they keep going, but why? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so can you give me more context for that? And mm. then at a certain point you go, okay, read this sentence. <laughs> you know, the, okay. just keep keep going down the thread. It'll keep going down right. this thread for you if you really care. Yeah. This text does that. So like I, I was asking that from the place of like, even if you're just interpersonal dialogue conversation mm -hmm. with someone on the street or in a coffee shop, you know, like what's the, what's sort of not a pitch, but like what's the sort of thing where you're like, did you know that X, Y, Z though? No, 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 that's that's not true. Did did you know? Mm. Blah, 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 blah. And they go, really? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, where can I find out more? You go, oh, yeah. I wrote mm -hmm, a book on mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. like a? Is there? Do you have that or? I feel like Rousseau, Rousseau would probably come up in that <laughs> conversation. Right, Maybe. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's definitely something, uh, you know, that 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 basic message that everything you know is wrong. Right, yeah, right. Uh, that's. Yeah, that was Rousseau definitely was a hook. The, Rousseau was was a hook for me personally. Yeah. For a lot of people, the Eurozine it, yeah. piece. Yeah, yeah the yeah, Eurozine yeah. piece. Yeah. That was weird because we uh, we drafted that piece and we sent it initially to the London Review of Books, and they mm. were very into it and they edited it, and then at the last minute they pulled it with no explanation. <laughs> mm. So we sent it to Harper's. Mm. Same thing. They edited yeah, it, they I were really this. into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they blamed it on the Trump, uh, there was the uh, elections coming up or something, I can't remember, it's 2017 or 18? Some, there was some big thing, 16, mm -hmm. 16 yeah. maybe. Anyway, they just pulled it, like no explanation. I don't know what was going on. Like mm -hmm. Maybe they sent it to Jared Diamond or one of these guys <laughs> and they said, don't do that. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of losing our patience a bit. Mm -hmm. And David was already a you know very famous, well-published, public intellectual is like what's going on with this stuff and we'd already 
published like a scientific article in a, in a good academic journal documenting all the points and everything. So he just said, well, let's just send it to this Eurozine thing. It's an online platform. They translate it immediately into various languages. Mm -hmm. I think Ukrainian was the first translation. Actually. Really? Yeah. Let's just get it out there by hell or high water. Yeah. And the guy who was editing Eurozine, uh, I... Um, his name's gone from my head at the moment, but I, I remember I thanked him in the uh, uh, acknowledgments mm -hmm. to the book because he, he really went with it. He just mm -hmm. got behind it. Uh, and yeah, that piece uh, definitely had a, an impact. That's when David forced me to go on Twitter. Because <laughs> I'm not, I don't, it's I ne horror, I've yeah. never had Facebook it's or horror, any of that. Yeah. It's really not in my nature yeah. at all. But he was like, oh, you're going to miss all the fun. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so I, I opened an account. And I mean, it's true. You know, you mm -hmm. do occasionally get wonderful uh, feedback and yeah. things that you just wouldn't have had a clue about. And right. then come the troll. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But I'm still on it. And I, 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 I wanted to, I have questions about that too, but mm. I wanted to ask that later. I was wondering if you could. Do we get a drink or something? That's <laughs> 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 water <laughs> You need water. And the champagne break. <laughs> <laughs> champagne and caviar. But I was mm. wondering if you could summarize for someone who just isn't familiar with some of these things we're referencing, like the Eurozine piece mm -hmm. or even what the what the point of that was. Yeah, Chief the Kanye Eurozine wrong, piece, the Eurozine piece was before we'd really, uh, got into the stuff about Kandiarank and the, mm -hmm. the relationship between indigenous American philosophy and the European Enlightenment. That came a bit later. Mm -hmm. The Eurozine piece was called How to Change the right. Course of Human, Human History, history. Yeah. at least the part that's already happened. And Kandiarank wasn't mentioned in that? I might be blurring. Mm, I can't yeah. remember. Uh, I don't it's, think so. Okay. I, no. I don't recall. Yeah. But it definitely wasn't the focus of right. that piece. Yeah. That piece came out of a kind of frustration when we started decide when we decided to work together. Mm -hmm. It was about the time of the financial crash, so 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and there was a huge like this flood of books by economists and historians right. about inequality, right, mm -hmm. and inequality indexes, and 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 this is what everyone was talking about mm -hmm. and writing about. And we right. started leafing through this kind of stuff, like Francis Fukuyama, Stephen Pinker, right. and. It's just odd because all that enlightenment stuff was suddenly back explicitly, like people right. saying, I am a neo Hobbesian thinker. I am a neo Rousseauian thinker. And uh -huh. humans really did begin in tiny egalitarian bands of hunter gatherers and then came yeah. agriculture and private property and inequality and populations grew and you had right. cities and that led to the state. And, you know, all the stuff that we thought we disabused ourselves of in the 60s, you know, mm -hmm. it was all back again in this right. really forceful way mm -hmm. in the context of an economic uh, uh, calamity. Right, right. So we just thought we need to do something about this as an anthropologist and an archeologist. Mm -hmm. You know, it's as if all the research that had been done over the last 50 years didn't exist because none of that stuff is really true. Right. So we just decided basically if no one else is gonna do it, we're just gonna do it, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're just gonna pull this thing to pieces and say, well, no, this is all, this is all crap. You know, it's, it just doesn't match even remotely the evidence that we have today, mm -hmm. which suggests that actually before you have agriculture, you already have like a, a huge range of different political systems. Right, so, right. you know, this idea that, that by growing wheat, you know, we, we sort of, uh, became entirely different kinds of human beings. I mean, it just doesn't stack up. It's also this yeah. broad sweep stagism thing. You right. know, the stages like, never right. went away. Right. You know, yeah. the idea that history follows some roughly linear path. Marx and, called it the March General. He actually yeah. critiqued stagism yeah. towards the end yeah, of his yeah, life, which right, a lot yeah. of Marxists aren't even That's aware. That's really interesting promote, because or, yeah, we, I, I get a lot of flack from what you might call vulgar Marxists. Right, you yeah. still want to do the stage theory thing and Marx the himself modes of production. Yeah. But you know, yeah. that's that's really interesting. Yeah. Actually, I have to get some references yeah. off you later. Yeah. Um, just watched a long video on it. I could yeah. send you, yeah. Thank you. Because I, wasn't, Cause I like, wasn't familiar. I just saw TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got the source. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's kind of staggering that that stuff is still the way that, that a lot of 
broad sweep human history is framed. Right, right. And if it doesn't fit yeah. the stages, it must be an outlier or an anomaly, right. a lag time or something, because inevitably yeah. it's going <laughs> to <happen. laughs> right. right. So our book is about all the lag time guys yeah. <laughs> who are not behaving according to script. Mm. Right, right, and there's a lot of them. Actually, right. they are most of human history. Right, yeah. Have you played uh, the game Civilization? Are you familiar? No, with I it? haven't. But it's... I did. Um, I did make friends with a brilliant person, a uh, Swedish, uh, called Agnes Larsson, who's uh -huh. one of the Minecraft mm -hmm. kind of. Thing. And she, we had some really interesting conversations about that civilization. I mean, I know roughly what it's about, but you know, right. what would be the possibilities of designing other kinds of games that didn't right, force yeah. you to follow that kind right, of right, right. dog eat dog uh, yeah. logic? Mm, you right. know, why not design games like and that? And clarifying question, just to be clear, 2008 is when you and David had that, that moment of, or was it sometime after that? I think, uh, no, it must have been 2009. 10 we started having those kinds of where it's like all right, let's start formulating how we're going to push against right. this sort of well was it concurrent or clear we used to meet up here in new york because i i mean it's it's kind of disgusting and I, I always make a point of this i did the same thing at nyu last night because david was between jobs as actors would say not right. having, <laughs> right. you know, having been refused tenure or between uh, yeah yeah right yeah God right. bless you. <laughs> right, it's great. Actually. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah that's good. Having been refused tenure at Yale, right, right, he just couldn't get anywhere in this country. Like nobody would look at him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he ended up uh, applying uh, to places in the UK. He applied to my university. He didn't get appointed. Um, and I ridiculously had two positions at the time. I had my job in the UK, and I also had a visiting thing here at NYU. And he still had his, his parents' place in Chelsea, up the road from the gallery where we mm -hmm. were in his place called Penn South, which was actually a right. collect, the union and uh, building. So he still had that place. So we actually used to meet up here mm -hmm. and just um, hang out. And all the Occupy stuff must have been going on around that time, but we never talked about that. We used yeah. to talk about anthropology and the Neolithic period. And right. He was just curious about my field. And what mm -hmm. was going on in archaeology right. and and i would tell him this stuff and he'd just be really like how come i don't know this <laughs> like, if i don't know this then who knows this? right mm -hmm. wait so you know do you have any evidence in archaeology of an egalitarian city because it was bugging him with occupy i think that even right. people who were sympathetic right yeah. always bring up oh, the yes. scale issue oh right, no. right. God. yeah <laughs> it was just Don't like you know, are there any examples oh are there any examples of egalitarian cities so i started telling him about these incredible sites in ukraine it's north right. of the black sea which are which is six thousand years old and they are urban in scale you know they're as big as the first yeah. cities in mesopotamia they're the size of medieval london yeah. but they've got no palaces no temples no rich burials it's just these neighborhoods of houses arranged in in concentric formations i'm actually doing a new project specifically about those now mm -hmm. um and you know he was just riveted by this and was sort of reading our way into it and stuff like that made mm -hmm. us realize right. that you know, we really need to do this just to disabuse people of some of these myths. Yeah, right. And you know, then I mean, it's I've always thought like one of the dumbest things you can do is attack an academic for having a political standpoint because mm -hmm. right. you know there is obviously a politics to that. everything right. it's politics. why you're asking those questions, questions and right. not some other question right. and that right. goes for everybody Every, yeah. it goes yeah. for the neo hobbesians and right. those guys they're right. all doing it the question right. is whether you're doing it consciously and transparently right right, right. Uh, which i i think we were and i think in the book we're very transparent about right. why we're following this particular thread right. and we also make the case that that stage-like view of history where you go it's modes of production and it goes for we've got a lot of trouble with leftists about this of because course. they're attached to modes of, of course, production yeah, but you right. know we, we make the argument that actually that whole way of looking at history that particular form of materialism where it's about how you make food basically right, hunter gatherers yeah. agriculturalists mm -hmm. urban commercial types right. industrial revolution was actually created as a way of silencing right. something else. Right, right. And that right. something else is what in the book we call 
the indigenous critique yes. of European mm. civilization, yes. which was basically native peoples, Native Americans who Europeans encountered. And there are many different versions of this that mm -hmm. come through in the colonial literature, basically right. looking at Europeans <laughs> and how, how French people behave to each other. Right. The Lord yeah. Farquhar. Yeah, just, you know, <laughs> deferring to each other on the basis, yeah. you, know, you are above me and I am below you. Right. Or the way that just having more stuff or more land allows yeah. you to tell people what to do. Right. Yeah. And it's like, or, 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 you know, beating up your children when they miss yeah. it. It's like, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. Where are you right. getting this from? Right. And, and yeah. in many ways, in terms of values that we value today, and that the, in the later enlightenment was celebrated like democracy yes women's freedoms right they were way ahead yes <laughs> yeah. yeah and yeah. the stage theory thing what it does and we found the smoking oh, gun oh yeah with this letter from yeah. Turgo to Graffini. we don't have to go mm -hmm. into all that but it's kind of a smoking it. gun there, there, are for, there are people who don't know i would love to go into so, it yeah. if you if you want to you don't have to okay get to the weeds, it's but. uh i mean it's Okay, it took me and David. It took me and David together about two hours to explain this on the video. <laughs> it was just me. It was a good exercise. Yeah, good, good, good exercise. Yeah. You can watch that other YouTube video. Yeah, <laughs> we, can, we can link to we'll link it. Yeah. I'm actually so grateful because there were two or three occasions when people filmed us talking together, mm -hmm. which I wasn't that keen on at the time. But I'm really yeah. appreciative that we have those things right. now. Right. They're, they're, they're there. Same. And there's one in Amsterdam where we talk specifically about this point. Mm -hmm, that we, we have the letter from Anne Robert Thiergo, who was uh, what they called a physiocrat. He was like one of the one of the uh, sort of budding young economists right. at that time. Right. Um, and he writes a letter to a French uh, salonier, one of these uh, amazing women who, you know, hosted in her home uh, mm -hmm. a group of uh, intellectuals and artists and scholars. And she uh, she was called the Madame Graffini, and she wrote letters from a Peruvian woman, which is about an imaginary Inca princess called right. Zelia. And it's another of these critiques, but this time it 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 comes largely from her imagination. Right, she's right. making it these up. Right, fake dialogues. Yeah, and, it's yeah. like these fake dialogues with a, a an exotic right. whatever. Right. Um, and. Um, in the story, uh, Zelia voices very similar critiques of European civilization to the real ones. Uh, in fact, you know, the whole genre of these imaginary dialogues between yeah. Europeans and so-called savages mm -hmm. actually has a basis in reality. And this is the problem in a way, is that people who write about that stuff tend to treat all of it as total fiction. It's right. just Europeans pulling it out of their hats right uh, the noble savage the noble yeah, savage mythology, yeah. but what we discovered is that actually there is a real basis to this and the genre actually comes out of the colonial the real colonial milieu like what was actually going on in the territories of the french colonies around the great lakes region and upstate new york the, mm -hmm, the right. traditional lands of the haudenosaunee and the wendat and mm -hmm. Uh, so on. Um, there were real encounters, and some of those did find their way back through the Jesuits mm. and through right, other kinds right. of literature. And they had an incredible effect on European intellectual life at that time and right. on theater. Right, There's a yeah, play yeah. by uh, Delisle de la Drevetière called Le Harlequin Sauvage, the Savage Clown, in which mm. uh, a Wendat comes on the stage and sort of rails against European civilization. Mm, right. So this is explosive stuff. This is a few decades before the French Revolution. Right. Right? Right. Um, so uh, Graffini writes one of these dialogues with an imaginary Inca princess. And uh, Thiergo uh, gives her feedback which is very sort of constructive, but he basically says, um, this is too much, this is dangerous, like the idea of a society without kings, right. <laughs> <laughs> a society without money, how's that gonna work? You know, there's too many of us, <laughs> it's too big. How's it gonna yeah. scale? How's right. it gonna yeah. scale? Yeah. No, this is yeah. where it begins. Yeah. And, and he encourages her to change the ending of the book so that Zelia yeah. sort of wakes up and realizes that she's being silly, right. and naive, <laughs> um, and she 
blows him off and right. publishes it the way she intended. And then he right. basically gets his revenge and he writes these essays on universal history, right. which are super famous. They like, had a huge influence on Adam Smith and the Scottish right. Enlightenment. And what he does is an incredibly sharp move, which we're still kind of dealing with the consequences, yeah. right. where he says, yes, these so-called savages have this equality, they have this freedom, they have all these things, but they don't have them because they are ahead of us. They can have the freedoms because they are behind us. Mm. And what he means is in right. material terms, uh, right? like they have less clothes, right. they live in simple huts. Right. So he right. shifts the terms of the debate to essentially forces of production. Guns, germs, and right. steel. This goes right, right into the Leninist tradition. Just right. straight. It flows right into, in, yeah, that's why yeah, we've got yeah. a section of the book called The Birth of the Left, you know, right. in some ways, because they're always right. trying to resolve that right. paradox right. Right. between the longing for freedom and the sense of being <laughs> caged, you yeah. know, by this inexorable right. materialist. The thing. Yeah. So it actually, it, it, it's incredibly successful as a way of silencing yeah. the indigenous critique. So, yeah, you can say whatever you want. Yeah, right, right. But it's it, it has about as much value as listening to the opinions of a leprechaun because right. you right. essentially <laughs> right. you come from Narnia. You know, you right. belong, you're yeah, you're right. like the living stone age or something. Right. Right. And right. we still see this, right? Yes. When you've got the, the, the guys lobbying outside uh, the climate summit or whatever saying, no, we actually have something to tell you about these landscapes. We've been yeah. here for generations. Right. But they're outside. <laughs> they're, not in, they're not in the room. Right. right, and this was yeah, this is a great way of keeping them out of the room, basically. Right. Right. So you go from a situation where there actually were serious dialogues mm -hmm. and 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 a transmission and an exchange of ideas into what then becomes uh, part of the basis for racism, right? What yeah. we call in the book the myth of the stupid savage, not right. the noble savage, yeah, because right? Rousseau didn't right. really do that. Yeah, but you know this fantasy of an individual that is sort of human-like, but right. can't actually see the future yeah. or the right. past. Right. Can't really right is, is dumb. It's basically right. dumb. And yeah. it, at that stage, it wasn't. I think. I think it was already biologized. You know, if you read Cedric Robinson, there was already right. some idea of race. Right. right. <laughs> but in this case, it was more about intellect. And then, of course, later you get eugenics, and it all right. becomes part of the same shit show. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why these like silly looking archaeology programs like the alien stuff, they're actually <laughs> quite dangerous because mm -hmm. they bring all that stuff back. Right. They want you to imagine a world in which intelligence is not it's uh, alien. It's <laughs> oh, I never thought about that. Intelligence is not something you or I have as individuals. It's something peoples have. Right. So there are like dumb people and smart people. Right. There's the wise sages of Atlantis. Right. Yeah. Who taught all right. the dumb people how to right. build pyramids. Right, and, right. You know, it's this. I actually wrote a critique. I actually did a Marxist critique of one of these Netflix mm -hmm. shows. And I, I think I read some of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it went in the Nation. Yeah, uh -huh. it was actually Robin Kelly in, in L.A. who right, sort of yeah. uh, provoked right. me to yeah. write this thing. Yeah, and because um, it struck me that um, I actually wanted to call the piece uh, "Spank Me." Please, <laughs> but, but they, they, wouldn't, <laughs> the title, just, yeah. they wouldn't let me, I think it ended up being called Apocalypse No or something, no. slightly so worse. But it's, it's, it's all right. Right. I want to call it Spank Me Please because it struck me that this stuff appeals to people who are basically nostalgic for yes. rulers. Yes. Right. Yes. Oh like my goodness. Natural we make this We make yeah. this spank me let please joke all the time. <laughs> Seriously. I say, I, what I always say is, oh, like people want daddies. Yeah. You know, mm. like they want. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, right. Absolutely. Right. Right. It's yeah. like, just imagine them standing along the banks of the Nile raising up multi-ton blocks with their minds uh, you know? right, <laughs> right. Uh, right natural yeah. masters where are the natural masters right. you know this right. is our story in yes, the uk we've the got adults, them as sitting yeah. in parliament now right. <laughs> you know? the natural masters yeah, people right. vote for them with yeah. their pedigrees from eton college etc wow. right. johnson yeah. being a natural master <laughs> yeah so i actually find that stuff at the same time ridiculous but also kind of yeah 
It's, freaky, <laughs> it's, a, freaky, it's a freaky phrase. Yeah. yeah. Natural mm -hmm. mass. But it's big. It's so popular. You know. Is it really? Oh, yeah. This Netflix thing yeah. is massive. We yeah. And what was the Netflix show? Oh, God. I had one of those. Ancient Apocalypse. Or something uh, like oh, so okay. like an ancient aliens kind of thing. Yeah. And they were like. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, when I think of like something like ancient aliens, I think of there's a tribe, uh, the Dogon people. Where oh, yeah. They have In Mali, right? I believe so, yeah. yeah. Where they have this like insane knowledge of uh of of uh, astronomy, right? And their specifically series A and B is like what yeah, they, yeah, yeah. what gets attributed to them. There's incredible and, architecture, as yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, and um, and like the whole thing, there's there's never a question of like how what technology do they use? They're, it's right. always no, they're from space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, like, they're from, exactly. They're gotta be from it's space. Like, it's like all this stuff, like pyramids or or Native American earthworks that align beautifully, yeah. with cosmological alignments. It's like the first. That's what you know. That's what pisses me off, frankly, about a lot of this conspiracy theory stuff is that it claims to be radical and yeah. going against the establishment, but it's actually the most conservative thing you can imagine right, because yeah. the baseline assumption is that these people should have been stupid. Yeah. So, you know, it's the old story that you start with idiots and then we gradually get civilization right. and that's why Gebekli Tepe or the pyramids of Giza are mysteries, right? Because right. they're meant to be dumb people, right? And the idea right. that, that that people actually, you know, that there are actually systems of technology or intelligence that have been lost, yeah. You know, the people right. who believe this stuff are actually the most kind of wedded to this very conservative idea of progress, right? right. They're not radicals at all. They're they're yeah. like trying to preserve an ideology that belongs in the late 18th century or in the 19th century or something right. like that. Right. Whereas actually what we need to try and get our heads around is that there are totally different forms of knowledge out there, right. which have been lost, but which are, you know, actually maybe if we start listening to people again, you know, maybe yeah. it's not completely lost. Yeah. And that includes forms of social. I'm not talking about acoustic levitation here <laughs> or something, you know, I'm talking right. about, you know, the fact that non-literate people also have yeah. incredibly sophisticated calendrical systems or forms right. of you know ways of managing land and, and resources. Yeah, yeah. and I'm saying to... forms of social social organization is exactly. right. included in that. And yeah. I mentioned, I said before, you know, people want daddies. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's not all people, right? It's like, but we're we're conditioned in this like paternalistic way to just accept. That 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 hierarchy, you know, that this mm -hmm. specific yeah. order arrangement of things. And the one thing I hear people say about how important the dawn of everything is and also in connection to the ecology of freedom is that mm. it just does this fundamental thing beyond, you know, dispelling of some of these mythologies, introducing people to some sort of record of these alternative forms existing yeah. Yeah. long ago, you know? Right. And I think that part is important too. This is well, you might have a different perspective on time, <laughs> given your, yeah, 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 yeah. But for most people, long time ago, right, centuries, thousands yeah. of years ago, right, you know, right, right, right. And how and how not, can that inform where we go from today? You know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like the, I think the way we approached it was to take all the kind of uh, sensitive, like the pressure points of right. the traditional yeah. story. Right, the origins of agriculture, the origins of cities, and right. target those. Mm. Yeah, it's not about providing some alternative, comprehensive right. global right. history. Yeah. It's right. about targeting the the key spots of the traditional narrative and just blowing them to smithereens yeah. right. <laughs> with data. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. right, just right. like showering them with data to show that that all the things that were meant to be happening at these threshold moments, yeah, that are meant to be irreversible and changed everything either didn't happen or something else much more interesting happened right. and in the process of of destabilizing that narrative right. other possibilities begin to emerge yeah right so that you begin to see all the pathways that weren't taken or that weren't right. necessarily leading to the nation state or, right. or our particular form of capitalism or democracy or whatever it may right. be right right uh, yeah that's the basic idea yeah, and I that's one thing I really appreciate is that there's not this like devotion to proving that humanity was a cer some certain other way. It's that mm -hmm. there's right. this range of possibilities and that we can choose we have actuarial intelligence and we can Exactly. we can choose to be whatever we want. Exactly. You know? I mean it's yeah. I've always thought it's interesting how in 
um, bringing it back to film and drama, yeah. when you have a, a movie where they will um, have people in ancient times or even in <laughs> medieval times just having an ordinary conversation, yeah. we find that funny. Like yeah. the Monty Python <laughs> thing, yeah, or the Mel Brooks right. thing, <laughs> right. where you know you've got the peasants in the field discussing anarcho syndicalism or something. Right. Yeah. We, we we find that hilarious, or Blackadder or something. Mm -hmm. Why do we find that funny? Like, what do we think right, they were talking? Them. Right, yeah. yeah, right. Do we think they were like constantly in a Shakespeare play and like right. you know? Right. Um, so I think it tells you something interesting about how we're conditioned. conditioned. Yeah. Right. 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 To yeah. think that people in the past were essentially not people, or not people like us, right? Yeah. Who could actually reason uh, about right. the kind of social forms they might have wanted or might want to reject. So, yeah. It's getting very serious, isn't it? I have a middle. I have a middle been ground. Been here on the <laughs> <first> <laughs> <potential>. <laughs> 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 I have a middle ground subject I want to put to you though, because you you mentioned. Twitter and social media. Uh -huh. I'm curious, yeah. like, what the haters have, like, and by haters, I mean, like, bad faith. They're clearly, and uh -huh. also yeah. in academia, not just mm. like oh, yeah. whoever, but people yeah. who are archaeologists I, or historians who are clinging to maybe some of these. And yeah. it's just like they, I don't, I'm curious where their mind is at and what they want from you. Me too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've seen some of it. And I'm like, what, what yeah. do you want? I've I mean, caught like, you, you address some of them in passing. Yeah. Right. Like, like yeah. did, you, did, you, did you receive the information? Like, what do you want? You know, right. what are you trying to get yeah. out of the. And then some. Yeah. Uh, there was, I saw uh, some leftists who did this. It may have been one, just mm -hmm. these long videos. Maybe you've seen, I can't remember what their name is. But where they're just, you know, they're just going, actually, it's yeah. it's a joke. But they're going, actually, you know, basically mm. <laughs> through the whole text. They're going like yeah. chapter by right. chapter. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm watching it. I'm, I'm like, what, what a sad thing. Yeah, to that's, how that's how I feel. That's how I feel. That's that's yeah. a big thing we talk about uh, on the shows that how those people are losers with no life. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what that's what you're saying. No, I mean, look, you just said uh, that it is a it is a compliment. I mean, if someone's literally got nothing better to do with their time, <laughs> thank you. Uh, right, if you're a loser, <laughs> go ahead. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I can't. David and I are on. Uh, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I thought sarcasm was going to be our thing. <laughs> you do that too. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, seriously, I can't worry about that stuff. I don't know yeah. if people have got their hands mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Right. No, I get it. Me. We did our homework. I get it. I used to Obviously, not. yeah. No, I used to do like anime videos online and I would have people do the same thing. So I get it. We're kind of the. We're kind of yeah. the same. We're kind yeah. of the same here, you know. You understand? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what been... am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. right, right, right. But have there have there been any that have just like that you found uh, sort of revealing, even in oh, terms yeah. of like the yeah. the the cognitive dissonances or the oh, the you mean like the bad faith? Stuff? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I I just switch off. Like if I start reading something, and mm. I don't think I'm like a horribly blinkered person who right. can't take criticism or right. anything like I mean I'm out there pretty much on a weekly basis right. debating this book on campuses or right. whoever will talk to me. It's not like I'm shying away from discussion. Of course. <laughs> Nobody right. can accuse me of that. Right. 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 Maybe some other things, but not that. Mm -hmm. But if I come across something in whatever medium it is, and I just see like a description of things attributed to us that are just Bear no resemblance to right. what we've written. Right. right. I just turn that's off. the through line. Yeah. I just that's turn the through off. line because it's, it's, it's pointless. Yeah. It's boring. Yeah. Actually, right. it's not my job to go and explain make them do their right. homework. Right. Know, to right. explain it right. back right. to them. Right. The the only response to that is read it again. Read it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was playing around, but we really do have conversations on here about like how interfacing with online is the new version of uh -huh. basically any dialogue, and how spaces where that's not the case it's yeah, really important. Well, I, yeah right and i guess uh i got uh someone dm'd me uh on twitter uh, a leftist who was um and you know it's, it's an anonymous person but right. they were suffering because in their uh discussions and so on they every time he would try and bring the book up somebody would throw one of these 
you know, like probably the kind of thing you were describing. Mm-hmm. So, oh, yeah. no, 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 that's been like disproven or right, whatever. Yeah. And he was kind of upset about this and saying, why don't you, David, you know, why don't you respond to all these things? And, and I was just like, <laughs> just get some new friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but also, I guess there, is a, a, there figures, is a space right. now where actually people don't read the book and they only get it. It's all from, secondhand. Right. That's yeah, a part of it. Yeah, they're only getting right. And and that is, um, yeah, I guess that is a problem, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And But I don't think it's anything I can do much about, except just stay out there. Just right. do my own whatever. Right. right. Yeah. Do my TED talk. I did a TED talk. I'm not like the world's biggest TED fan. Yeah. But I want that platform uh, and, and, and do things like this. You know, that's what I can do. And it's it's I think on that point it's 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 grounded in critical thinking, mm-hmm. you know, and like that's just so fundamental. But it's it feels so there's not enough of it, you know. Just like foundational principles for maybe us, but in terms of how people are re- receiving information, especially you know the big conversation now is you know how do you trust the information and where it's coming yeah that's how am i supposed to trust kind of mystifies me because so many of these books about big history and the broad sweep of human history they're not actually written by people like us who actually trained as archaeologists Mm, they're written by people totally out of the field right right yeah but we get shit Right. <laughs> like, how can we right. trust these guys? Yeah. Right. A senior professor of archaeology and a senior two of the like the top ten universities in the world. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's right. that's suspect. I mean, right. so, like, that's what's missing. Yeah. That's a part of what's missing. It's interesting. Right. I yeah. mean, it's part of that discrediting of experts. Right. Which yeah. we see everywhere. Yes. Right? right. I mean, it's in our politics as right. well. Yeah. There was even that British politician who said, I don't want to hear any more experts. Right. <laughs> um, so reason, yeah. logic, it all go. It can go, all go out the window. Yeah, now. we get that. Yeah. I right. mean, yeah. it's you yeah. know, uh, uh, an evolutionary psychologist who's trying to write about this stuff without ever having really grappled with with the data or anything like that. Right. They're okay, right? But we're, you know, how can we be trusted? And right. you know, it just if you reflect on the fact that we're not doing this in a in a bubble, we have to go on campus every day and teach our students and talk to our PhD students. Like we're not gonna make monkeys of ourselves sort of just pulling stuff out of our, you know. So yeah, I don't don't really get that. Um, I I think at this juncture, it's, it goes into the cultural dimensions of how information is being transferred now. You know, it's like who's culturally being the broker between this hard, you know, critical, well-researched work, and then the people that yeah. are like, I'm never going to go to the primary source. I'm never going to go. You know, I'm not going to look into. And that it's myself. not about it's not about deference. You know, I'm right. not saying that because we do this for a living, you have to believe everything we say, or right. it's above right. debate. And you know, yeah. if you've ever yeah. seen David in in discussion or presentation, he was all about the to yeah. and fro. Yeah. Dialogue. It's not about that. It's right. not about deference. Mm-hmm. It's just about recognizing that if you devote yeah. 20 or 30 years of your life to this stuff, mm-hmm. hopefully right. you do actually learn something on the way. Right. Which you're trying to share. Right. I think I do think in a funny way capital and capitalism is to is is to blame for ah, this in this in the sense that you know, on the trust thing, it's like, well, yeah, you can have the the credentials, but like anyone will do whatever for money, right? Right. And well, so, yeah. so I'm That's not. Sinister. So listen to me. I'm not doing it mm. for money. So right. listen to yeah. me. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a part of like the Jedi right. mind trick, you know. And, right. the, and the people right. aren't going to also... think, you know, critically about it. So, you know, right. it's just going off the, of. There's also the through line. Of That's life. what I meant by the Free cultural. Thought. Right, that's what I meant by the cultural dimension piece of it, you know? Platforms like YouTube, Patreon, Spotify, they're all ass. They don't respect your privacy, they're riddled with ads, and they're completely silent and unreachable when you need help. Have you ever talked to somebody at YouTube? Think about that. I sure haven't. To top it all off, we don't control them at all, despite being the reason they exist. So that's why we're partnering with a design and development agency called... 
to build our own cooperative alternatives that bring the best features of all those platforms together and that we can control together too. We seriously got to have an exodus to some sort of digital Zion that we've built ourselves. Somewhere where all of us can actually have a say over the technology that we're using to communicate with each other. For more on how you can support us all in getting off these shitty platforms, visit opencollective.com slash digital Zion and tap in. Just because these dystopian systems are eating themselves alive doesn't mean they got to take us with them. Real yeah, quick, sorry. Our uh, monitor turned off. I think we're still recording, but it's recording. Okay. Mm. It probably just ran out do of. Do you need? Do you need anything? Yeah, by coffee. the way, coffee. <laughs> 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 I wish I was a coffee drinker. Oh. Had some coffee for you. That's a... How long have we been going? We're at, uh, we're at uh, hour forty. Really? Hour forty. Okay. So much longer than we have made the list. Yeah. It's oh, yeah, no, yeah. no. It's it's, it's yeah. whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah. 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 Um, I could. Order. I mean, I could get a coffee delivered. Does anybody else want coffee? Yeah. And what timeline are you on? We're. F- what I think is we're the f- actual time. We're. F- it's six o'clock. Almost six. Okay. We're flexible okay. on time, so it's all about what you're comfortable with. Like maybe you know, we another could, half hour. We could go like yeah. Rogan and go for like five hours. <laughs> is that what he's out? He, yeah, he'll go. Oh. He'll go yeah, for I like a, five I hours. had a blunt about this big. I wanted to smoke. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I love it. Yeah. Exactly. After we turned into actually. I, um, we didn't talk about that, but you know, oh. I got invited on the Rogan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you be comfortable talking about that on here? Or no? Well, there's nothing to say because I didn't go on it. Um, but they wanted me people to go. Would fi- people they would did, find that they, they did want me to go to yeah. Texas and spend a whole day there or something debating <laughs> that. Debating. Oh, Ancient God. aliens. Oh. 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 You, now wow. we need to talk about this. Yeah. Now, the, to your, the to guy, your point. The hair guy or just like one of the guys? There's a hair there's a, guy. There's a hair guy. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The guy. That's been yeah. a meme it's since. The British guy. Yeah. Well, or no, it's just the guy who goes, alien. Alien. It's oh, a no, meme. Yeah. It's been no, no, a meme for yeah. like a this decade. There's a British guy called Graham Hancock who's, I think, uh, his mates with Rogan, and mm. Rogan appears on his shows and God knows uh, what. But yeah, so it wouldn't have been much of a debate, you know. Uh, this yeah. is the Netflix guy. Oh, okay. So he would have crushed you, wouldn't have been. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, <laughs> is, <laughs> this is. <laughs> when you were talking earlier about, oh, how this this is da- oh, yeah. dangerous, this right. is who I was thinking No, I have about. no idea who that is. No, this yeah. guy is called Hancock. And, We're still uh, recording, by the way. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, wow. Mm. And so you don't yeah. think that debate would have been fruitful for anyone? I don't think, I'm and this kidding. is basically, <laughs> I basically <laughs> said, <laughs> he's joking. I'm sorry. No, but again, you know, I don't want to come off as a snob yeah. or mm-hmm. something. I don't talk to anyone. Although this guy strikes me as exactly the kind of guy you don't want to get stuck with in the right. pub. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like right. Right. Talking to a flat earther or something. Right. But uh, Why I that? said I said <laughs> what I've got to say in that piece I wrote, which is basically that there wouldn't I can't see how there would be a starting point for a debate because right. the trap that you're supposed to fall into as the expert or the archaeologist is to like get tied up in his bizarre chronological schemes or something right oh no but that's like two thousand years too early or something right and that's the role you're meant to play because you're the you're the expert who's a gatekeeper and who's kind of guarding all this knowledge Mm -hmm. and and do you know what i mean um so, you know, even to to kind of begin on those terms, given that what he's saying is so completely divorced yeah. from what we actually know. Right. Right. You know, like he's got this argument that the there's a kind of um period at the end of the last ice age in geological terms is called the younger dryas period, mm-hmm. where you get the end of the ice age and then you get a beginnings of global warming and the beginnings of the Holocene uh, geological phase. And then there's a blip called the Younger Dryas. Uh-huh. See, you're interested now. You're thinking uh-huh. aliens. <laughs> <laughs> tell oh, there's a tell blip. More. There's a blip. Uh, and it's a period of about 
thousand or two thousand years yeah. in which you get this sudden uh, snapback to cold glacial conditions. Mm. So all the people are coming out, they're thinking mm. it's party time, you know, the <laughs> ice, ice age is over, and then suddenly you're sort of back to ice age. Right. And I think in the story he tells, this is meant to be like some cataclysmic, you know, event which wipes out half of civilization or something and then you get this little band of hardy survivors who are the wise sages the sort of atlanteans who survive the ice age and you know can then um preserve all the knowledge from the lost city of Atlantis. <laughs> you know you see what i mean yeah. like what kind of debate Come on, right, right. right. Come and we on, know right. so much about the younger dryas like in the middle east there's all kinds of stuff going on in the younger dryas right and you know they might have been a bit cold, but they're also, <laughs> right. they're also building villages and actually, yeah. you know, doing interesting yeah. things with crops and yeah. making mm. little figurines. I mean, so, you know, t I think this stuff has to be treated as what it yeah. is. Right. right. And what right. it is, is, is a kind of, um, it's myth, you know, yeah. right. it's, it's like weaving a, right weaving a certain it's like a system of thought which has its own logic yeah right so i yeah i i don't yeah. you know i think especially if i were to go on something like the rogan show where you know there are editors and you mm, can end yeah. up being cut down to a sound bite right which exactly makes you fit right the yeah. role that you are meant to play Right. right, which is that of the uh, the gatekeeper of knowledge and so on. So it's <laughs> right, a, it's, right. it, it's a trap. academic crushed by. So weird, weird. Gatekeep right, right. knowledge by writing and then publishing a book for everyone to be able to read yeah. and get the knowledge. Right, it's a weird way to gatekeep it. It is mm -hmm. interesting because you know, I we get a lot of messages from people you know, like you should bring on someone that you disagree with and have mm -hmm. a real debate and like otherwise it's a it's a bubble or whatever that could is, still happen can, if i don't get coffee soon <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna turn into a it's physical gonna debate get very <laughs> ugly <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna get back to brawling no no no, no. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, but what, no. what is this <laughs> <laughs> Is this edible? Does this have caffeine in it? If I chew on this, yeah, yeah, this is these are actually co ground coca leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, but no, people like try to try to. Stop. <laughs> It, I was once at an, an academic meeting with a guy who was yeah, even more of a caffeine addict than, than I was, and they, they didn't have any coffee, and he was getting desperate, and he actually took one of those little, in his bag, he had one of those little Nescafe sachets, and he snorted it. Oh. What? <laughs> wow. Serious. Oh, that's, Holy that's, shit. Per that's performative. <laughs> that's like, that, is no, an that's, adult? That's like, <laughs> that's like, yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah. That's like that's, European that. caffeine addiction. <laughs> You're, you're injecting espresso into your oh my arm. God. That's oh insane. God. That's performative. He, re he just really they just, wants they you just to They just have it. upper addictions here. <laughs> <laughs> We're just addicted to amphetamines here. We don't yeah, do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, the point you were making, though, was about um, yeah, people wanting pe this entertaining, people, combative. People want it show. to be a, a back and forth, and like they want you to really stand on what you mm -hmm. on what you believe in or whatever. But like sometimes it's just facts versus uh, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Just uh, mythology, mythology yeah, yeah, but, fantasy. Um, also, something no, that has but, hegemony over already it's already like it's already right. like the dominant it's a, thought. Yeah. The dom it, dominant thing it's yeah. A ver yeah it's a version of the dominant narrative yeah. and it's it's like there's a i don't think people recognize the value in just being able to get your message out clearly and just being able to you know just I, speak cohesively and like and i also yeah. putting I think out it's, a thing it's related to the critical thinking point though yeah people yeah. who they don't want to do that thinking and the, the, the closest for them of like of getting to that is like seeing what you're saying be put to the test by being put against mm -hmm. yeah. something that is challenging it. Right. And then they go off of feelings and emotions to judge and the performance of it yeah. to see who won. And yeah. now I'm gonna side yeah. with more secondhand uh, interpretation. Now I'm gonna side with the person yeah, who I exactly, feel like won. Right. You know, yeah. the idea that it would be framed as a sort of game of winners and losers right. Is, right. Is, is, right. is itself it's like yeah. right. completely arbitrary right. Right. way of actually conducting a discussion. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we're in that 
age. I mean, especially it's us, about the quality you know. of the discourse, right? The way we right. see it eroded down in every field of life, right? Especially politics, right? I mean, in my lifetime, it's amazing how the you know the the, the actual quality. When I was a kid, he used to have these programs on a Sunday on TV where this guy Brian Walden would just sit with a politician and grill them for like yeah. three hours Fine. and there was like no frills i just like i've got this person in the chair and i'm going to hold you accountable for your policies right. you know right and now nobody even expects the truth right uh, so it's this kind of erosion of the discourse um i got interested recently in this italian uh, kind of polymath guy called furio yezi who died in the uh, 1970, I think, when he was very young, but he was clearly some kind of genius. He started as a, he was already writing Egyptological treaties as a teenager. And then he went into philosophy and he was particularly interested in mythology. And it's one of these times when I sort of curse my linguistic incompetence because a lot of it is not translated into English or badly translated. Yeah. And he did a lot of studies of, um, of Germany, actually, mm -hmm. and particularly the 1919 revolution. He wrote a book called Spartacus about mm -hmm. Rosa Luxemburg and all that stuff. But the one that really interested me, he wrote a book called The Culture of the Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, how you, you rarely see close cultural analysis of right-wing thought. Right. I think because a, a lot of leftists are slightly condescending. Right. Yeah. It's like those guys right. are hillbillies. Or, yeah, right. So, you right. Know, right. It's not worth analyzing. Right. right. But he does it, and it's actually fascinating yeah. with regard to early 20th century Germany. And one of the things he talks about is myth and how right wing thought and fascist thought, they require the human past to be like putty in your hand, like something totally unstructured right. and malleable. Right. Yeah. So just by introducing structure and complexity, mm -hmm. you're already actually undermining that right. kind yeah. of myth making. Right. Because you know? right. it's not black and white. Right. 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 <laughs> right. right. So it becomes a question of who is willing to wrestle and, f and fiddle with the gray Mm -hmm. of it yeah. all who's willing to dive yeah. into that yeah and yeah. try and parse it yeah that's what uh this is a thought i had last night that was really interesting to me because be because people have that scale question in terms of society and the reality is in many ways we're trying we've like simplified society in mm -hmm. a way that's catastrophic you know over right. over thousands of years right you know right and the reality is like it's not in, as complex in fact we've reversed a lot of the complexity in yeah. a lot of ways, you know? I'm also but, thinking of Adorno's, um, the authoritarian personality on this yeah. point uh -huh. and how, yeah, people who are, you know, because of how we're conditioned under paternalism, they, they either see themselves as the dominator or the one who's supposed to be dominated mm. and how it makes you more susceptible to these, this type of setup I was describing before, you know? You know, I'm gonna watch these two battle it out, and the dominant one, the one that mm. feels dominant to huh. me, wins. You know, it's not. It's not. I don't. I'm not gonna th interrogate the con the content of what's being said here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or th you know, think that I can think about it myself. Because who am I? This is actually. It's quite helpful for mm -hmm. me actually, because I, you know, I'm trying to think through like, what do we do now? What do I do now with mm -hmm. the uh, the legacy of this book? Right. And you know, we put these concepts out there. Right. We want people to run with them. Right. And we we ourselves intended this to be the introductory book to a whole series. Um, David used to joke that like this is the Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Wow. Then, wow. Just the Hobbit. The wow. Oh, wow! But it doesn't work because the Hobbit is quite a small book. <laughs> <laughs> We've already done the Return of the King. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know what he was thinking of, but and we mm -hmm. didn't really have a scheme or a plan like what this would look like. We just knew there'd be three. <laughs> it's yeah. quite typical of the way we work. <laughs> um, so there should be three, three sequels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yeah. cool, um, but one of the concepts that that I I know you know. I, I've noticed over the past year that, that engages people and they want to talk more about is this idea of the three basic freedoms or the three basic right, three yeah. forms of, of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, one of which, the second one, is the freedom to disobey. 
And taken just like that, that can sound a lot like uh, the kind of libertarian freedoms that could be uh, anti-vaxxing or anti right but it's not. Yeah. Because <laughs> the way we explain it is that it's back to the quality of the discourse. The, the way we introduce that is actually through the historical example. Right. Of those uh, indigenous societies, mm -hmm. in what the anthropologists call the Eastern Woodlands, um, where you had these very advanced, sophisticated cultures of debate. And, right. you know, the point about disobedience is that if you can't compel someone, you can't order someone to do something, you still have to do things, but the only other route is through persuasion. Right. Right. And even the Jesuits who hated this stuff, you know, they would constantly complain that, you know, how can we convert these people when they don't take <laughs> orders? How are they going to get the Ten Commandments when right. they don't right. have commandments? Right. You know? <laughs> uh, they, so they were very attuned to this. And some of them, uh, like Lejeune and Sagal in the mid 17th century, they recognized this relationship between the absence of compulsion Mm -hmm. and the cultivation of these very sophisticated systems of conversation and debate and oratory. They were constantly amazed at how indigenous people right. who were you know, not even literate mm -hmm. could make these speeches that to their ears sounded like something from Aristotle. So yeah. How did, you know, where does that come from, that intelligence come from? So the, the freedom to disobey is grounded in the cultivation of a culture of, of listening and of debate and of, mm -hmm. of tolerance. Um, I'm thinking about Chief Kandirak on this point. Precisely, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, the, the, the Kandirak, insofar as we can reconstruct this individual, comes exactly out of that kind of right. milieu, that, that kind of cultural tradition, you know. Right. Um, so it's exactly the opposite of a purely kind of libertarian disobedience, just like a fuck you. Mm -hmm. right. Which is actually a micro form of domination. It's not a form yeah. of freedom right. at all. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Because right. right. you're not it's... leaning into the consensus. You're not leaning into. Well, you're uh, limiting others' right. freedoms. You know, right. It's yeah. the point that right. Orlando Patterson made about uh, the Western concept of freedom is that it actually comes out of slavery. Yeah. Mm. So it comes out right. of the uh, the relationship back to domination. Right. Being dominated comes out of the master slave relation. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a kind of inversion of that, but in inverting it, it reproduces the same logic. Right. I'm thinking about Jordan Peterson calling himself a classical liberal. Politically, I'm a classic British liberal. Temperamentally, I'm high in openness, which tilts me to the left, although I am also conscientious, which tilts me to the right. Philosophically, I am an individualist, not a collectivist of the right or the left. Metaphysically, I'm an American pragmatist who has been strongly influenced by the psychoanalytic and clinical thinking of Freud, Jung, and the psychotherapists who have followed in their wake. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what you just described is the contradiction of classical yeah. liberalism, right. you know? Right. They're right. talking about all these virtues right. in the abstract while, right. have, you know, enslaving people. Right. Right. Exactly. You know? yeah. So, you know, I think uh, what needs theorizing and what needs thinking about are what you might call social freedoms. Right. So yeah. a kind of freedom that actually enables other people to be free. Right. Which right. I, th I think we struggle, we being anyone who's, let's say, broadly educated in the European or Western way of tradition, I think we struggle with those concepts, actually. Um, so we put this idea out there that there, there are basically three forms that we felt we could kind of identify and distill in which we see operating in many, many cases, almost anywhere actually, which is either uh, um, before or beyond the shadow of the modern state. Mm -hmm. You can see these forms of freedom operating in a very concrete way. Yeah. And that includes things like ancient kingdoms and empires, which, you know, we've all been to museums. They, they always project this image of, I am the great king who is like a god and commands everything. And they project this image of totalizing power. But actually, one of the fun things that archaeology can show right. is it's mainly bullshit. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. They can't compel these huge numbers of people to do right. things in the same can't even way. can call that... another country and be like, you're doing what I said. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and they can't wait for a parchment to come back. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they yeah. can't make it rain either. <laughs> but they say they can. Yeah. Right. Um, right. So actually... Soldier Boy can do that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course. Yeah. 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 Well, so low, coffee. Low uh, <laughs> what was that? Coffee. Uh, we uh, <sighs> we can just wrap it up. It's not, you know, yeah. you gave us a lot of time. Yeah. Unless you want to do a break and come back. But I mean, I don't know. I would love more time with you, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm <laughs> serious. Yeah. If you can get me an espresso or something, I've got another half hour in me. I think. I'm, I say let's <laughs> do it. I'm happy to run out. Yeah, or I but it's up to you. I could just get Starbucks delivered. Oh, you got to get it delivered. Oh, oh no, it's no problem. I tell you what, we can just we could we could. No, no, I want you to be comfortable. I'm comfortable. I'm just getting a bit sleepy because. No, uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> I've got this, I want uh, one. I want something too, honestly. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, take your pick. Uh, I'm on Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Do they have crazy iced Dunkin coffee? Dunkin' Donuts coffee. <laughs> Do you just want? What do you do? You just drink black coffee or? Yeah. Okay. Does, does it have to be that big? Like, oh no, yeah, no, we're gonna get you a jug. Of we'll coffee do, we'll do a small regular, <laughs> a small regular, and, get and we'll you do a gallon two. of that express. No hard. dairy. You want one too? Probably, yeah. Does anyone else want a coffee? I get panic attacks with coffee. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll do it. Black coffee is fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Iced and small. Okay. The cut to this is gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jump cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me get him. You yeah. guys are between chops. Right? No, no, no. <laughs> no. It'll Actually, come right to the, it'll come right to the yeah. door, right? Yeah. Huh? You're oh, ordering yeah. it, right? So no, can... he's saying, uh, but I, I got it covered. Don't worry. You, you couldn't do this in the UK. I don't really? think you can get coffee delivered, right? So full transparency to the group, it's it. I had to text the guy to come here because I, you know what's weird? <laughs> it's like when you get a lift, it just knows delivered to where you're physically at. I mean, we're getting stalked twenty four seven. What's the point of that if it doesn't know where you are? It's, it's taking and, it to your at your address. It's taking it to my address, but luckily that's that's ten minutes away it's from here. It's not far. It's not far. And I and I texted him. Yeah. So. <laughs> Sorry you know, about that. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I, I like how you stop yourself. Yeah. Yourself yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, with, with valid. Web. Valid what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But I'm sure they'll bring it here. It's not far. I, pr I promised a, a fat tip. Speaking of enticing and mm -hmm. orders and things like that. I was saying, I, I was curious if there was a thread that your 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 brain was following um cuz you said it's funny and then you started talking about um intention with this text and then forms of freedom and we had just been talking about uh I had brought up Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. and like the classical liberal thing in response to you talking about the the this right-wing libertarian contradiction if you will of like mm. you're you're saying that you're about liberty but in actuality there's the underbelly is some form of domination or enslavement or yeah it's a point that um david made in a number of his books mm -hmm. which is also in the dawn of everything right about that particular legal concept of freedom which relates to property. I mean, it really right. comes out of slavery right. and property relations. Right. And it's that point about the um, the basis of European property law, right? which goes all the way back through many complex intermediaries yeah. in the Middle Ages to Roman law, mm. where the ultimate right of ownership was the right of abusus or abuse. In other words, to own something is to be able to dispose of it, right. to commodify it, to abuse it, to sell it, um, do anything you like in particular. And this applied to people. You know, right. This came out of slavery as a, as a domestic institution. So it applied to your household slaves, and it was the the pater familias, the father of the house, had this kind of authority over his own children as well. Mm. Um, right. So there were three grades of ownership. There's the right of uh, 
usus, which means the right to right. use something. Usufruct, fructus, yeah. Yeah, usuf yeah. it's a yeah. usufruct is like a combination, combination of the first two. Yeah. Yeah. Fructus, where you, you use the fruit literally of, of whatever, so you can you can pick those berries, but you don't own the, right. the right. land they're on. Right. And then uh, the the most complete form of ownership in that legal tradition is is the right of abuse. So freedom. <laughs> I mean, it's really revealing yeah. Uh, yeah. in terms of how we think about freedom uh, as connected on the one hand to ownership. Right. Uh, and on the other hand to abuse. Right. Um, so that purely kind of atomized individualistic right. libertarianism is always at the cost. It's always at someone else's expense. Right. I'm not going to wear my, my, my COVID mask on this train i'm asserting my freedom right. never mind that the old lady next to me you know whatever this is my freedom right. that's you know a kind of toxic freedom which is really a form of domination right in my opinion you know a great irony in this that we use commonly use the word libertarian mm. to yeah. describe this and it's, it was an appropriate, it was taken right. from anarchists. Yeah. So I think we use a word that was taken, that was expropriated. Yeah. Exactly. You know, from it's confusing. <laughs> and it's something, it's yeah. some it's a confusion. Joseph that, de Jacques, just for people yeah. who are right. curious. So I think we have to take these concepts back. I mean, I think it was like yeah. the worst kind of uh, intellectual and moral mistake that the left made is to give freedom away <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. um but you know this i don't think this can be just kind of an ideological move or counter move it's got to be underpinned by something right right, right. like some positive notion of what those freedoms might might mean so right. the other one that we talk about a lot in the book is freedom of movement mm -hmm. but again you know this isn't just like some purely individual uh, right thing it's predicated on an infrastructure yes so it's predicated yes. on the idea of asylum yes. and hospitality right. uh you know we talk about these traditional clan systems where people mm -hmm. could move over large and you have versions of this on every, right. every continent like horn of africa australia north america right. where people could move away and be received uh, outside their even outside their language group right because right. they are um, part of this extended network of of care and hospitality and these kind mm -hmm. of things um yeah so that's freedom number one freedom number two is the, about um, disobeying arbitrary mm -hmm. authority and then the third yeah. freedom the most important one is the ability to actually um, abandon a particular social form imagine a new one and then collectively enact it just create a different and you know what we see concretely in the the archaeological evidence is people doing this all the right, time right. in the most incredible way you know we've got this bizarre idea that actually having a constitution where you sit down and say <laughs> i want to design a society this way and not that way right. is something that montesquieu invented in l'esprit de loi you know in the enlightenment mm -hmm. or whatever, right. and that somehow other people throughout 200,000 years of history weren't doing that. Mm. They were just sort of floating along like corks on a <laughs> tide. It's, it's weird, but it's this is the default way, it seems to me, this is the default way of describing human ancestors. Yeah, and here right. they didn't have this capacity. The Constitution right. is supposed to be forever. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, if we don't have this, everything falls apart. Yeah. Chaos. Right. There's nothing. Yeah. Code that doesn't need <laughs> That's, updating. Right. Oh, that we, uh, no firmware updates. Yeah. yeah. We talked about no, that. None. Just one and none. <laughs> just, I love that, that idea. If, if they just did what's on the paper, everything, <laughs> everything would be great. All, yeah. all the rules. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what, what we need to figure out um, more, that, you know, having just raised these questions, what we now need to try and, and figure out is the relationships between these freedoms. Like, how does the breakdown of one kind of freedom lead to the breakdown of the other kind and eventually mm, yeah, lead to a yeah. situation where it's basically unthinkable to actually deconstruct and then reconstruct the social order in, in any fundamental way. Right, Not just right. like tweaking around right. the edges, but just to say, okay, this is a disastrous path we're on. Right. right. Why can't we move? 
yeah. you know, why can't we get off yeah right so what is it that leads us to to a position and you know we don't pretend to have definitive answers in in that book we we right. we have some pointers and we have yeah. some hunches and they're based on evidence but mm -hmm. all of this needs more much more thinking through right uh, actually and there's a precedent for it in america right mm -hmm. the, with cahokia and these other places like, yeah that's a really yeah. important case study uh, yeah. in the book um because well for a number of, of of reasons it does seem to exemplify this phenomenon of just moving away yeah from uh, a kind of authority that is becoming right uh, oppressive right right, right. um moving away and and just reconstituting society in radically different oh forms but it's also it's a it's a key point in relation to the second freedom and that whole tradition of democracy that europeans encountered yeah. on, in the eastern woodlands because you know what they assumed and this eventually is what comes through in the writings of rousseau is that that's just what these people were like but what we try to <laughs> what we try to argue in the book and it's um it's an argument which yeah. is controversial but uh it is certainly not beyond the bounds of possibility is that actually the kind of uh, um, democratic forms of participatory governance that europeans encountered were actually a historical counter reaction to this right. earlier thing which right, is yeah. epitomized at Cahokia right. which is this much more hierarchical yeah. uh, form of society and there are examples of oral literature there's a Cherokee story about how we used to have these guys yeah. <laughs> these priests who you know abused women and abused right, their power yeah. and then you know they dispatch them in some violent way so you know there right. were these memories of an authoritarian past and right. get it in the Haudenosaunee stories as well. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's getting to the point, I think, with my field, not just in North America, but in Amazonia, for example, where you can start to put the pieces together of like the deep history that wasn't meant to be there at all, yeah. but is there. Um, and what Europeans encountered when they first arrived. So you can begin to see you know, a historical pattern taking form, which is really important, I think, because it, it, it's the only way to really get away from this idea of um, like natural freedoms or yeah do you know what i mean right right like, as if these as if you didn't have to work there's for no these sense things. of organization right. as right. if there were people to whom they just sort of they're just born that way or something right which is itself a form of racism basically. right right yeah right that or it's a part of a natural progression of history that exactly. so you can just twiddle your thumbs until the next free right. society comes and right right it, and then you've got other examples like in the midwest and and we talk about the osage nation for example where they did all three freedoms at once <laughs> so actually the 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 word the indigenous word for um um moving away was the same as basically founding a new constitution so right. you know what we would call a social movement actually mm. right it's wow. like a physical movement uh, so they're constantly relocating in each and this was recorded in the case of the osage we have much better accounts of this because the person doing the recording was was an indigenous guy called francis la uh, he mm -hmm. wasn't himself a sage but he, mm -hmm. he was actually fluent in the language so we have a much better handle and and it's incredibly complex like the kind of constitutional discussions mm -hmm. and reformations they would have um yeah i mean it's indisputable that these things were, were going on is there a particular text or oh and by the way that we know that there was a delegation of osage who went mm -hmm. to paris at exactly the time that montesquieu was composing uh, this wow <laughs> wow um wow just saying wow i was gonna say just there... saying for the haters <laughs> <laughs> are there any like texts or resources like you'd point people towards to explore that in particular more is there a lot written or yeah published about yeah 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 uh i would definitely check out uh the work of uh i think it's robert warrior okay wrote a fabulous book on uh reclaiming some of these intellectual traditions as you're describing that i'm just i'm thinking about 
you know, indigenous Mayas and the Merez in Chiapas, Mexico. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. modern day examples of this. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the context is different and the forms are different, but it's the same thing of people m moving to reorganize themselves, even in this right. global nation state, you know, context that we're in. Um, this is a really key point, and it's actually something that I wish we'd made a little clearer in the book about mm -hmm. the indigenous critique. So, the you know, what we call the indigenous critique, first of all, it's one of many possible critiques mm -hmm. then and now. Secondly, it's not like a worldview. Right. Mm -hmm. It's more like a weapon of choice. Right. You know, it's right. a, it's it's responding to a right. very particular form of colonialism. Right. In the same way that if you look at more recent indigenous critiques like uh, Davi Kopenawa, you know, gives a shamanistic critique uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Amazonia of capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, that is, you know, that is addressing a different enemy to the one that landed on the shores of, of what's now Canada in the 17th century. So right. I think like it's so easy to slip back into a mindset where you say that sort of anything that comes out of the mouths of a non-European person right. must be expressing an ontology or like right. a total worldview. It's like people right. are strategic. All people right. are strategic. Right. They can do both. They can be multilingual. They clearly were multilingual. Right, right. You know, they can also play games and right. and, and, and have oppositions. And um, so, yeah, the, these are um, these are strategies which right. draw on rich cultural traditions, but they don't contain the totality of that tradition. That's right. that insight is at the center of Zapatismo as a framework. It's uh -huh. like at the center of what they put put forward exactly what you just described. Can you tell me a bit more? Because I, I, I'm curious, like, uh, how that... Well, the point is on methodology, right? Like, mm -hmm. from their standpoint, people analyzing what the Zapatistas have been doing for decades and and going, well, you know, this is this this is the strategy to get uh, to get yeah, free, okay. right? Right, right, right. And coming back with that, well, you know, our context is different. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the cultural context, the geographical right. context. You know, you slip so easily into right. a kind of non-historical fantasy world, right? right? Yeah. Where these things are static and and total right. and yeah. This is a huge yeah, yeah. thing with the the so-called left, right? Huh. It's yeah. like it's actually a part of why a lot of the left is authoritarian because they actually want to they want to they want to believe that i mean there's a million and one different layers to to, to this um conversation but yeah. you know it's like wanting to believe that mm -hmm. you know with the people's republic of china or all these third worldist movements that you know in the end look they they got a nation state and they got a flag mm -hmm. you know and and it's kind of more embarrassing at the, this level of conversation because we're we're just we're we're looking at capitalism and colonialism with. Well, just I think a that's what that, that, that's what got David uh, Graeber so excited about what was going on in the Syrian cantons, right. in Rojava, right. And actually, um, this was kind of serendipity again. Uh, I was doing archaeological field work in Iraqi Kurdistan. Wow. It's mm -hmm. basically the same people. Yeah. It's like an extension of the, the so-called uh, Fertile Crescent, I'll right. mm -hmm. just still right. call it. But um, I was doing that, I started that before I met David, and a colleague of mine called Gabe Mashenska actually gave me a book by Abdallah Erchalan. Erchalan, yeah. Wow. Uh, one of the ones that had been translated, and um, it was part of the Prison Diaries series, mm -hmm. right. like the first one, I mm -hmm. think. Okay. And... Uh, I found it fascinating because I was actually going to do research on Neolithic sites, which have a very large role to play in his thinking. Right. right. But I remember I checked it out on the web and it had uh, two Amazon reviews. One was a five star and it was like, <laughs> this is the first truly post-colonial history of the Middle East. It's like the most important book. Right. And the other one was a one star 
know, it was yeah. like, this guy's a terrorist. <laughs> right. Read a book by Osama yeah. bin Laden. He's a Turkish George. nationalist. So right. he ends up with an Amazon rating of three. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm reading Still so, pretty good. For, uh... <laughs> so I, I actually read that stuff before I met David and possibly before he read it because I think it was only later yeah. that Debbie mm-hmm. booked in and sort mm-hmm. of turned him on to that. Right. But, you know, what was clearly so exciting about it, and he went over there numerous times, um, is that they were very clearly rejecting that whole trajectory. And so we yeah. don't want, it's like the only people in the Middle East saying, we actually, we don't want a state. Right. You know? Yeah. Right. And, you know, it always kind of um, peeves me slightly when, you know, some, I sometimes get that reaction to our arguments that, oh, well, if you're right and if there are all these other pathways, how did we end up with a world that is covered from end to end with nation states? Yeah. What? Well, look. Yeah, no, I get, <laughs> I get this. Like, uh-huh. how come it all led, you know, wh- why, do, why does it all look the same if, if, if yeah. we're such a creative species and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, well, just look at what happens to people who try not to do that. Like, look at the violence. Well, that's my, yeah. that's, that's where my, what? That's look where at, that comes look from. Look at the violence. I mean, imagine what would happen if <laughs> right. those people that's were actually allowed Right. right, just for a year or so, you know, yeah. without 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 bombs and and yeah. without militias attacking right. them, and without being deprived of water and sanitation. Right. Imagine what they could do. Right, but in fact, what's happening is this supposedly natural political form called the nation state, which is meant to be the logical culmination of human history. Just wind it up and watch it go. <laughs> is so insecure. Right, that it needs to be right. Like right. on right. it all the time, making sure these people cannot have peace. Right, right, um, and and I think a lot of what we're pushing back against is um, the sublimation of that violence, which says instead of looking at the last five hundred years of racial capitalism, let's talk about the Neolithic period. As, yeah. You know, talk about processes over ten. Let's not say the past isn't important. Right. right. Let's just say it's not yeah. important in that particular teleological sense. Right. right. That effectively gets the proponents of violence off the hook. Right. 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 Um, it's convenient. And if yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. if nation states really were the you know logical culmination of of human social development why are they so insecure that you know why <laughs> right. why do they right. need standing armies you know you could just sit back <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. just just let it happen yeah. right we right. don't need to yeah, let it die empire. out we don't need to enslave people we don't need genocides we can just sit back and watch this thing unfold because yeah. obviously since the agricultural revolution though Nothing else could, <laughs> right? No. Um, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my initial response is like it's a, it's a logic of coercion. Yeah, the whole right. thing is predicated on taking and violence and and holding the gun up to your face and saying, you know mm-hmm. what to do, right? You know, mm-hmm. you know, you need to do this, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And when you have these global hegemonic organizational bodies uniting with each other in that yeah. logic of coercion. You really need yeah. to like pay attention to the pushback. Right. It's really yeah. important. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's I've, a lot of insight in there. Yeah. And it's reinforced in subtle ways. I was just thinking about the concept of just like, I get mail from people I've never seen in my life. And I just think about that. Like people I don't know, just know where I live mm. at, at all times, <laughs> you know? Like that's just a scary, like subtle thing. Where I'm just like, I guess he I doesn't better... have that problem because there's no sign <laughs> okay, of that no, coffee. No, <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no one can find like, this. Who got the coffee, coffee con? <laughs> it got to my place, and oh, it, it, I'm having my girlfriend lift it over for you. I'm uh, so well, sorry. For us, yeah. but I didn't realize. No, it's like it's it's. In it. it's, it's it's the gig economy. Let's unpack it. Right? <laughs> yeah, how do we get? I here? think we're, we're we're probably like grinding towards a conclusion. Yeah, yeah. This I'm sorry. Yeah. I, no, that's I fine. You, David you did it no, no, You no, definitely no, gave no, us no, another no, thirty without the coffee. So many yeah, things. Yeah, 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 I appreciate yeah, yeah. that. I'm not sure about quality. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, you, you should see it. some of the <laughs> some of the more slower moments on oh, this program. Yeah, you'd be <laughs> surprised. Quality. You'd be blown away. 
<laughs> uh, we just needed someone with a British accent to come on here. Yeah, and I think us. <laughs> wing it at least. Yeah. An hour. <laughs> oh yeah, before people get on to you, like yeah. Yeah, just being, <laughs> see all you in the comments. We got a guy. <laughs> right. We got someone. They here. still trust us. <laughs> British, but not Hugh Grant. Yeah. They're yeah. Getting right. Through the first hour. <laughs> Would, uh, you, would you come back on again? Sure. But yeah. you got to get that guy who my friend likes. Mm. Zach. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Then I'll oh, come yeah. back. <laughs> okay. I want to yeah. get Debbie. And Debbie. You, you and yeah. Debbie. That would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be great. Because I do, I do want to have a conversation about the ecology of freedom and, mm -hmm. and its sort of connection to mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we do like yeah. a little Freaky Pleasure. Friday thing and Zach lives Debbie's life and Debbie just lives don't, Zach's please, life. Please, just one thing, just don't ask me to do remote because I hate it. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, I no, feel you. No, yeah, never. No. Does my nah, head in. Never. I mean, <laughs> remote coffee failed me today, so. <laughs> <laughs> so just, I could have, I could have. Okay, thanks, guys. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, thank you We, so we have yeah. a tradition, though. We we clap out. Oh, yeah, that's right. We clap together uh, okay. to end every yeah. recording. It's true. I, I can go with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to count to four, and we clap on four. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't want to. <laughs> this is like a, this is what we call, in English, this is like what we call a, a Sunday cricket clap. It's like. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Like that yeah. kind of clap, but we just no, it's, but it's just no, no, one no, clap. It's, it's like a sync clap. clap. It's just, oh, just all like of us sync, clapping yeah. together. Oh, okay, it's, just it's like one. Oh no, we don't like, just go. It's like one, and then two, three, 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 we just one, we just applaud every four. Like, yeah. It's like a sync clap okay, on the yeah. floor. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, thank you for being here. Yes, thank you so much and sharing your your insights and your knowledge, and people will appreciate it. That's a pleasure, guys. And it was great. Yeah. All right, one, two, three. Last thing Thanks we gotta get his head. Right. Sorry, we have to get your portrait. Yeah. Oh, get your oh, portrait. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I've been in this situation many times in <laughs> deepest Amazonia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one last thing. We just need to keep your we head. Just, yeah. <laughs> you don't you're not using that. <laughs> you're not using that, are you? For anything? <laughs>